This is Atomic Shinobi and today I am going to narrate fourth part of What if Naruto becomes higher of a Duke Wolf. If you enjoy this video, please like, share and subscribe to this channel. Now wasting no more time, let's start the story. You're Zanjetsu and you're actually sentient? Zanjetsu simply nodded in response to Naruto's shocked and incredulous question. To the astonished expression of the whiskered ravenette, Zanjetsu said, I am Zanjetsu. You created and imbued me with power far beyond what any other weapon would have connected with me to try and awaken my power. It is you who chose my name and now I have awakened, Naruto. He then smiled broadly. Naruto exclaimed, revealing his true self as he realized he had accomplished something he doubts anyone else has ever done before. Creating a fully sentient weapon on his own. Ha! Huh? In those Takumi losers' faces. I created a sentient sword, something I doubt any of them have accomplished. I wonder if I could create other sentient weapons or even be better, sentient weapons that can fight themselves or even turn into a human form, then I would create truly living weapons. Zanjetsu snapped Naruto back to reality with a firm, enough, perhaps you created me, but there is no guarantee you would be able to replicate such a feat as it was the materials and teachings you received that helped in my creation. The Uzumaki stopped and coughed lightly in embarrassment at losing his composure. Naruto begged eagerly for the opportunity to access Zanjetsu's full power much faster, especially so he could escape whatever those Takumi bastards are doing to him. Right, yeah, I just… didn't expect this to happen. But if you're sentient, then would you be able to help me in unlocking your full power or how I could access it myself? Instead of answering, Zanjetsu abruptly called forth a duplicate of his katana form and lunged towards Naruto, startling the whiskered brunette before he swiftly ducked to avoid the slash. I'm having a severe case of deja vu, thought Naruto, recalling the attack he had suffered at the hands of Zen. Aku when they had first met. As soon as he saw Zanjetsu leap into the air and raise his blade to strike him, Naruto conjured up a duplicate of his own sword. The sentient blade did the same as their blades collided as the Uzumaki leapt and swung his sword at Zanjetsu. He blocked Zanjetsu's kick when he kicked his leg at him before raising his arm. The sentient blade fell back to the ground as Naruto suddenly moved, grabbing Zanjetsu by the ankle, toppling over him, and slamming his foot into his face. Naruto fell through the air, only for Zanjetsu to flip in the air and land on his feet, charging him once more. As the Uzumaki flipped through the air and over Zanjetsu, their swords collided once more. He instantly slammed his foot into his back, grunting. Naruto became irritated that he had to prove himself to his own sword. If this is just to prove I have the determination or whatever to wield you, I already did the same thing with Zen. Aku! And I made you, shouldn't that give me a pass? He exclaimed. Prior to swiftly backing away to avoid taking Zanjetsu's next blow, he was taken aback when the sentient sword threw his own katana in his direction. When Zanjetsu brought down another katana on him, the whiskered ravenette blocked it first and then deflected the sword that was aimed at him. Zanjetsu demanded, spinning his sword around and pushing Naruto out of the way to stab at him. You may have proven yourself to Zen. Aku, but not to me. Being my creator means nothing if you do not possess the resolve needed to wield me. How could you ever hope to wield my full power, when you haven't even fully tapped into the power you inherited from Zen, Aku? However, Naruto deflected Zanjetsu's attack by dropping his sword, catching it with his other hand, and swinging it through the air. Then, he flipped his katana into a reverse grip and lunged at Zanjetsu, but Zanjetsu dodged it by bending back. Then, seizing the opportunity to lower himself, Naruto kicked out wide, causing Zanjetsu's legs to give way beneath him. The sentient sword was knocked back when he slammed his foot into its chest. Zanjetsu skidded back, appearing flawless, only to flip through the air and land his feet once more. Naruto shot back, not liking the suggestion that despite all of his training, he isn't as strong as he thinks he is. What are you talking about? I have all of Zen. AKU's power? I turned into him against Ryujin and killed him. I've been training constantly so I can do it on command. Then, as Zanjetsu materialized in front of the Uzumaki and slammed his fist into his stomach, causing Naruto to crash into a tree, the latter gasped in agony. Zanjetsu rushed Naruto again, slicing the tree in half with a single swing of his sword as he barely had time to move aside. As Zanjetsu raced towards Naruto, he slashed his neck, causing the whiskered ravenette to raise his sword and block it. Such a thing you could only do after receiving help in awakening Zen, AKU's power within you. And what progress have you made in being capable of transforming on your own? 
You think the power you used against Ryujin is truly the peak of Zen? AKU's power? I have sensed it the moment I was completed and you have only scratched the surface of what you could be capable of. And so as long as you continue to hold yourself back, you will never be able to call on that power on command," Zanjetsu said, charging towards Naruto. What are you talking about? exclaimed Naruto, perplexed as to how he could be holding himself back considering that he had been attempting to change into Zen. Aku ever since they had arrived back in the village and that he and Yugo had spent the entire journey to Takumi village. He would gladly get rid of anything preventing him from transforming at will so he could carry on with his training. The Uzumaki growled in frustration at Zanjetsu's cryptic reply, you must let go and embrace what you've become. Before leaping away from Zanjetsu and charging at him once more, he meant to force the answers from the sentient sword if necessary. In conjunction with the Kunoichi, hidden shadow snake hands, Enko exclaimed, hurling several snakes from her sleeves in the direction of Ryugan. Ryugan then swung his Garion sword in their direction, extending the three prongs to slay the snakes. With a mocking smirk, Ryugan said, you really need to try harder if you want to beat me, then, he channeled chakra into his sword, transforming its extended prongs into three dragons that charged at Anko. After giving hand signs and launching a stream of fire at the dragons, Anko exclaimed, then how's this? Fire style. Dragon fire jutsu. But the dragons lunged through the fire, forcing the purplet to use a substitution to escape. When tree roots started to grow out of the ground and entangle him, Ryugan, who had been grinning at her for trying to flee his dragons, opened his eyes wider. Soon, a whole tree encircled him, securing the Takumi ninja to it. Kuranai said as she came out of the tree and pushed a kanai at Ryugan's neck, you should also be more aware of your surroundings. The Genjutsu mistress and the tree both burst into petals as one of the other Takumi ninja threw a spear at them before she could finish the blue net. She covered her escape with another genjutsu before the spear could strike her. Why don't you follow your own advice, ninja? Ryugan scoffed as multiple snakes erupted from the earth beneath him, forcing him to duck out of the way. Smiling, Anko put her hands on the ground and said, Nah, a brat like you needs it more than us. Snakes burrowed into the earth and emerged from her sleeves. The tokabetsu janin was concentrating on Ryugan when another Takumi ninja charged at her from behind and stabbed her causing her eyes to widen. Ha! Huh. That's one of you or. Ah! Uh, exclaimed the ninja, grinning at the death of a Konoha ninja. However, he screamed in agony as Anko abruptly transformed into dozens of snakes that lunged towards them, injecting and biting copious amounts of venom. As Anko leapt out of a tree and threw multiple kanai at Ryuga, he exclaimed, why don't you tell your friends to mind their own business? Said Ryugan, swinging his sword, why, are you scared, knowing you're only delaying the inevitable? The kanai burst into flower petals that started swirling around him. Kuranai jumped out of the flower petals to stab Ryugan in the back, tauntingly asking, it seems you're the one scared to face us alone. Does that mean you know you'd lose without backup? But, as it lunged at her, one of the sword prongs turned into a dragon, blocking her blow. Grinning that they believed they could defeat him with or without assistance, Ryugan yelled, how about you just shut up and stop running? Anko threw another kanai at him, but before he could swing his sword and block it, his eyes widened upon seeing the explosive tag attached to it. Before he could dodge, the tag exploded, throwing Ryugan back and causing him to grunt as he crashed into the ground. Then, much to his ire as he attempted to break free, a large snake erupted from the earth and wrapped around the blue net before he could even get to his feet. Anko smirked down at Ryugan and spun a kanai around her finger before tossing it at him. I suppose not answering is enough of an answer, anyway. However, before the kanai could strike him, it was deflected by another Takumi ninja, allowing Ryugan enough time to focus chakra into his sword. He managed to swiftly stand up by transforming the prongs into dragons that tore the snake to pieces. Ryugan swung his sword and threw the dragons at Anko, saying, I'll enjoy feeding you to my dragons. Pink mist appeared around them as Kuranai charged at the blue net. Satsuki and Hanada, meanwhile, were dealing with the Takumi ninja on their own. The two genin had only been able to defeat a small number of them before being driven back. Lightning style. Lightning ball. Exclaimed Hanada as she sent multiple lightning. Balls flying in the direction of the Takumi ninja. One of the ninjas swung a big fan and let out strong gusts of wind that scattered the lightning, saying, try harder you little brat. Okay. Fire style. Fox fire. 
exclaimed Hinata as she performed her hand signs and unleashed ten blue fireballs at the ninja, causing them to grow larger and faster due to the wind gusts. Three of the Takumi ninja leapt to safety as soon as they saw the fireballs approaching, but Hinata threw several senbon infused with lightning in their direction, causing them to cry out. Their bodies went numb where the lightning struck, so there was no need to aim at any of their pressure points. Allowing Hinata to charge in their direction and start using her Tenketsu to strike the ninja, incorporating more lightning chakra into her blows, causing them to fall to the ground as the blows rendered their bodies immobile. That eliminates three more, Hinata thought, then her eyes grew wide as she noticed two more Takumi ninja coming at her from behind. But Satsuki's two arrows piercing their necks killed them before they could get to the Hyuga or she could counterattack. Hinata turned to face her friend and saw another Takumi ninja lunging axe. Wielding towards her. With lightning chakra flowing through them, the Hyuga swiftly withdrew a few senbon and threw the needles at the ninja. Satsuki turned to face the ninja, but before she could do anything, the needles had struck and paralyzed them, causing them to fall to the ground. Despite this, the Ravenette did not hesitate to transform her bow into her swords, clenching her teeth as she blocked the sword of another Takumi ninja. Satsuki was thrown through the air and crashed into a tree, only to gasp in agony as something struck her side. The Uchiha tensed to stand, gritting her teeth in agony, only to have her eyes expand upon realizing that her swords had fallen. As she realized that Takumi ninja, who had lost her swords, had struck her with a big hammer, she fell to the ground. She then watched helplessly as the ninja broke her swords into pieces by slamming their hammer down on them. The ninja mockingly exclaimed, What are you going to do now that you have no weapons, little girl? Which caused Satsuki to frown and glare at them. Satsuki threatened the ninja, saying, I'm going to smash your head with that hammer, before hurling a few shuriken at him. Satsuki charged at them, but the Takumi ninja deflected them with their hammer and jumped into the air when they swung it at her. After slamming her foot into their faces, the ravenette was flung back by a gust of wind from a different ninja holding a fan, causing Satsuki to fall to the ground and having to roll aside in order to avoid getting cut in half by an axe. The axe. Wielding ninja taunted Satsuki, who was about to attack when she had to jump out of the way of a bow. Staff, grunting in pain when it still struck her leg. What's the matter brat? You were talking so tough earlier, but now you're running away. Another ninja remarked, ninja really are just talk, after all, too afraid to fight without anything to protect themselves with. The ravenette then scowled and threw several shuriken at the ninja. Fire style. Phoenix sage fire jutsu. Exclaimed Satsuki, releasing multiple mini. Fireballs that covered the shuriken while making hand signs. Only to cry out when a trident. Wielding ninja let loose a wave of water that halted the shuriken and put out the fireballs before directing the water towards Satsuki. As the Uchiha continued to fire the water blast, Hinata charged them from behind and struck them in the back with her palm, sending them hurtling back and smashing into a tree, causing the ninja to collapse, which allowed Satsuki to fall to the ground with her. When Ryugan saw an opportunity to throw one of his dragons at her, Satsuki threw up some water in protest of having to dodge, as his allies kept Kuranai and Anko occupied, he managed to get an opening. With a sly grin, Ryugan said, Don't worry, runt. Once I deal with your friends I'll finish you off, personally, if I'd even want to waste my time on a weakling like you, anymore, before having to stop Anko from being bitten by several snakes. Oh no. Satsuki scowled at the taunts as she dove under a sword strike from another ninja, detesting the fact that Anko and Hinata had to intervene to protect her from the attacker. Even more so considering that she hasn't really defeated many Takumi ninja despite persuading Hinata to follow the Janin in order to save Naruto. While Hinata alone incapacitated several of them in addition to saving her. Together with eliminating the ninja who kept interfering in their battle, Kuranai and Anko defeated Ryugan. However, she has only killed a handful before losing her weapon and becoming essentially defenseless. Though Hinata and Satsuki appeared to be on equal footing, Satsuki was well aware that Hinata had gained confidence and had rapidly surpassed her in strength. Not only that, but her Jukan's full power could be utilized because her Dojutsu was already unlocked. In order to further enhance her abilities, she also added Senbonjutsu and Ninjutsu to her repertoire. She even learned and developed new Taijutsu techniques. Satsuki was aware that her skills and training were not stalling, but even though she was robust and well-rounded, she wasn't becoming any more powerful than her teammates. 
being aware that there is a roadblock preventing her from realizing her full potential. How come it doesn't just wake up already? Satsuki saw her reflection in the kanai she had drawn to block a bow. Staff that was swung towards her head, and she scowled at her still. Onyx, black eyes. The ninja quickly pulled their bow. Staff back and slammed it into her chest, sending the ravenette skidding across the ground before she let out a painful grunt. Satsuki immediately straightened up and got ready to defend herself when she noticed multiple Takumi ninja advancing on her. Kuranai and Enko saw Hanada and continued to try to approach her, but they were constantly stopped and had to defend themselves. Oh no! Why does this continue to occur? Why will I never have enough strength? Satsuki let out a mental cry, hating the fact that she's preventing her teammates from helping her and making them vulnerable in the process. Which only served to remind her of the massacre, how she had been left defenseless and unable to take action, and how Itachi's lack of conviction that she was not worth killing was the only reason she was still alive. And now it's happening once more, leaving her defenseless, but this time she is powerless to protect herself. How can I defend the people I love when I can't even defend myself? How will I ever be able to stop what happened that night from happening again when I can't even save myself? Satsuki wondered to herself. Satsuki's mind started racing, recalling the massacre, her battle with Naruto, and her first C rank mission. How Ryujin and Lycan overpowered her before the latter kidnapped her. In both instances, Naruto assumed responsibility for her rescue, almost losing his life in the process while battling Ryujin. Retrospective. The blue net and green net were staring at Naruto with concern as Satsuki, Hanada, and Fu sat inside the tent he was currently lying in. Even after they brought Naruto back to town, the Uzumaki still doesn't appear to be awake. Satsuki said, causing Hanada and Fu to turn to face her because the Ravenette didn't seem in the slightest worried, he's going to be fine. Worried and even afraid that her first friend, other than Shibuki, and fellow Jinchuriki, could have perished, Fu said, how can you be so sure? You saw the destruction where they fought each other, it's a miracle Naruto's even still alive, let alone in one piece. Satsuki spoke, and both girls took solace in her words and her conviction, because I know Naruto and he wouldn't have let some failed experiment like Ryujin defeat or kill him. He's going to wake up and be perfectly fine, you'll see. With a feeling of relief and increased assurance that Naruto would wake up soon, Hinata remarked, Why dot ye? Yeah, Naruto.kun is really strong, I'm sure he'll wake up soon. He's probably just really tired and will need plenty of rest. Fu said, nodding at them from Satsuki, yeah, he'll be fine if he was able to take out Ryujin. On the inside, Satsuki was feeling just as anxious and afraid that something might have happened to Naruto, even though neither of them knew it. This occurred along with strong emotions of failure, guilt, and self. Loathing. Thinking she could have done something to prevent them from being apprehended. That if she had been able to assist, she wouldn't have had to leave it up to Naruto, Fu, and Lycan to save them and beat Ryujin. Knowing that Ryujin would have killed Naruto if not for the late experiment's assistance and sacrifice. Satsuki was so terrified at the mere notion that she vowed to never allow anything similar to occur again. Final flashback. But it did occur once more. But now it's Naruto who's been taken prisoner. I can't even repay him for saving me when he nearly died trying to do so. Hating that her circumstances have now changed and that, despite her previous resolve and words, she is unable to save him, Satsuki thought. The ninja with the hammer lunged towards Satsuki and swung it at her head, forcing her to duck out of the way. Prior to them leaping into the air after her, she had to block the axe. Wielding ninja as well, preventing them from burying their axe in her chest. Only to groan in agony when she was knocked through the air by a gust of wind. The ninja with the bow. Staff then plunged their staff into her chest, sending her smashing into the earth. Satsuki gritted her teeth, stood up, and glared at the ninja surrounding her before turning her head to glance back at the others for a moment, something unfamiliar yet strangely familiar in her eyes. Her thoughts returned to that evening, to the instant before Itachi ran away. Retrospective. Itachi looked over his shoulder at Satsuki with his Mangekyo Sharingan and said, There is no value in killing the likes of you. My foolish sister. If you want to kill me, curse me, hate me, and live a long and unsightly life, run away, run away, and cling to your pitiful life. And then someday, when you have the same eyes as I do, come before me. Satsuki feels dizzy and falls forward as she looks at him in pain, despair, and shock at everything that has happened. Satsuki nearly fell to the ground, 
but she was able to catch herself and land on one knee while gasping heavily. Her eyes turned crimson red with a single tomo in each before her head snapped up and she glared at Itachi. Itachi seemed unfazed by his sister's awakening, at least on the outside, even though he was a little taken aback inside. Prior to that, the older Uchiha leapt hastily to the rooftops, sensing the Anbu's impending arrival. Satsuki yelled, No, you won't get away, Itachi, as she got up and chased after Itachi, gathering some of the kanai that had fallen. When Satsuki spotted Itachi, she leapt to the roof, threw the kanai at him, and wouldn't let him go. Itachi, having drawn his sword and deflected the kanai, looked back in surprise at her attempt to attack him. The last one actually knocked his forehead protector off his head, causing him to flinch. Unfortunately, Satsuki expended what little energy she could muster in her attack, panting heavily and collapsing to her knees as her Sharingan deactivated. The last thing the Ravenette saw before she started to fall forward was Itachi picking up his headband and giving her a tearful look. Final flashback. The staff. Wielding ninja charged Satsuki, intending to drive their staff straight through her chest. Time to die, brat, they yelled. To their surprise, Satsuki sidestepped the staff, grasped one end, and then flipped the ninja over. She brought them to their knees by slamming her foot into the back of their legs, then she grabbed the other end of the staff and pressed it up against their throat. Prior to the ninja attempting to escape, Satsuki let out a grunt, drew back the staff, twisted it sharply, and snapped the ninja's neck, causing them to become limp. Not content to stop there, Satsuki charged the enraged ninja, who was brandishing a hammer, while holding a staff. The ninja charged Satsuki with their hammer, screaming, You little bitch, I'll turn you into paw. Aw. Oh. But Satsuki ducked under their swing and stabbed the staff straight into their eye, causing them to scream in pain. The ninja dropped their hammer to try to remove the staff due to the sudden pain and loss of their eye, but Satsuki turned around and grabbed the hammer out of the air, proving that their action was incorrect. She gave a shout and whirled around, slamming the hammer squarely into the ninja's head with her momentum. Their body was launched across the field by the force of the blow, which also cracked open their skull. Despite this, Satsuki continued on, slamming the hammer into the ground and then spinning around the handle to avoid the axe. Wielding ninja's blow to her back. The ravenette then took out a kanai and stabbed it squarely through their shoulder. Satsuki made the ninja drop their axe and scream in agony. Then she rolled across the ground, grabbed it, and swung it at their neck. The last thing the ninja saw were two tomos whirling around the pupil of their crimson red eyes, glaring at them before their head shot out of their body. Before Satsuki threw the axe and buried it in the back of a ninja that attempted to attack Kuranai after she had avoided Ryugan's dragons, the fighting briefly stopped. Causing everyone to turn to face the ravenette, Hanada smiled as she saw her friend awaken her own dojutsu, her eyes now crimson. Only for one of the Takumi ninja to charge at Satsuki, emerging from a silver hilt wielding what appeared to be a blue sword made of pure chakra. Satsuki, however, ducked and spun around their slash as soon as they were close enough, grabbed the person's arm that was holding the sword, and broke it in half at the elbow. The ninja were screaming in pain, but Satsuki silenced them by taking the sword, stabbing them in the back of the head, and then throwing their body aside. The last of the Takumi ninja flinched in horror at the sight of another of their comrades dying, and that too quickly. More so when Satsuki pointed the chakra blade at Ryugan, causing the blue net to turn pale and involuntarily back off. The blade changed color from blue to red. You're next! Satsuki yelled as she lunged toward Ryugan. Ryugan yelled, What are you waiting for? Kill her! With some panic when he saw Satsuki sprinting toward him after killing four of his supporters with ease. As Hanada took advantage of the situation to eliminate a few more Takumi ninja near Satsuki by striking them in the arms and legs with Juken strikes, several of the surviving ninja raced towards her to defend their leader. A ninja attempted to strike Satsuki with a club, but she managed to slide under him and use her chakra saber to almost cut him in half at the waist. A kanai thrown through the neck of a Takumi ninja will take them out before rolling across the ground and dodging its side. A third ninja lunged towards her brandishing a second chakra saber in an attempt to take down the ravenette. The ninja were momentarily frozen in midair as Satsuki's head snapped up, locking eyes with them and trapping them in a genjutsu. The second chakra saber turned red as the ravenette leapt up and slammed her knee into the ninja's jaw. She then flipped over and grabbed the other chakra saber from their hands. She then proceeded towards Ryugan, 
stabbing both blades into the ninja's back and leaping off them before they hit the ground. Ryugan exclaimed, how can two brats be this strong, as he watched Satsuki and Hinata eliminate one of his followers after another. However, he was met with laughter from Anko. Anko exclaimed, not believing he had not figured it out, you, you mean you seriously can tell? Okami, you're even dumber than I thought? What the hell are you talking about? Ryugan exclaimed, feeling uneasy and incensed at her meaning, while Kuranai gave him a sly smile. Kuranai revealed, making Ryugan pale with fear. Those two aren't just regular genin, they're from the Hyuga clan and Uchiha clan. And you just helped Satsuki unlock her Sharingan, or reawaken if those two Tomo or anything to go by, Kuranai said. Even though Takumi village despises ninja, they are aware of the reputations that the Uchiha and Hyuga clans have. Particularly the latter, who were regarded as one of the most formidable and feared ninja clans and who needed to eliminate one of their own. W well, let's see how long they last after I kill both of you, Ryugan exclaimed, masking his anxiety at facing two ninjas who were similar to them and thinking that killing Anko and Kuranai would demoralize them. Anko exclaimed, you'll die trying. Many hidden shadow snake hands, as she let loose dozens of massive snakes that lunged towards Ryugan from her sleeves. Ryugan retorted, directing a great deal of chakra into his sword and letting loose the three dragons toward the snakes. You're the one that'll end up dead. However, as soon as his dragons started tearing through the snakes, they burst into petals of flowers, and Enko soon followed suit. His eyes widened as soon as he realized it was a genjutsu and then he saw the flower petals shooting themselves in his direction. Ryugan tried to jump away at the sight, but he ended up staying put. What the hell? Ryugan exclaimed as he looked down to see several snakes slithering out of the earth, encircling his legs and hissing at him before lunging forward to bite him, causing the blue net to scream. Ryugan became terrified that the flower petals were more than just a genjutsu and that weapons were concealed within as his cries grew louder as they struck him and started to pierce his body. Ryugan screamed as a bigger snake sprang up from beneath and bit down on his wrist, holding his arm in place, as he raised his sword to sever the snakes and free himself. Ryugan clenched his teeth and attempted to channel chakra into his sword in an attempt to free the dragons, but he was startled when the snake bit his wrist more forcefully, giving the blue net the impression that he would probably lose his hand if he attempted to use his weapon. When he realized Satsuki now had a clear path and was coming straight at him, his panic and fear increased. Jumping into the air, Satsuki said, you should be lucky, I'm wasting my time to personally kill a weakling like you before bringing both chakra sabers down on Ryugan to kill him. Regretfully, before Ryugan's attack could land, she quickly used substitution jutsu to trade places with a Takumi ninja, which allowed Satsuki to defeat them instead. Ryugan yelled, you're all dead when Seimei. Sama is revived, before teleporting back to Hoki and his fire sword in a quick green flash after channeling chakra into the Garion sword. Before they could act swiftly to eliminate the last of the Takumi ninja, the Kunoichi became irritated at seeing that he had managed to escape. Demoralized by their leader's abandonment and the fact that they were much stronger than they were, they managed to quickly overwhelm them. After the other ninja were eliminated, Anko said, Well, I gotta say you brats are way better than I expected you'd be. Kurenai nodded in agreement as he grinned and turned to face Satsuki and Hinata, impressed by their skill. Since you've awakened your Sharingan, Satsuki, how would you like me to help you with your Jinjutsu training? Whether you want to train with my team or separately is up to you, Kuranai said, grinning at the two genin, impressed and proud to see for herself how far they've come, especially Hinata. You both did handle yourselves rather well, even against such superior numbers. Thank you, Kuranai. Sensei. I appreciate the offer. Satsuki grinned back at the offer, knowing that she would be able to begin her genjutsu training with her Sharingan. Anko put an arm around Hinata's shoulder and exclaimed, and I can help with your training, Brad. This caused the blue net to let out a startled, eep. Re.re. Really? Hinata asked, taken aback by the abrupt proposal. Yeah, why not, I saw how you were using Senbon against these guys and how you were channeling lightning chakra into them, I can help you get even better at throwing them and teach you the perfect spots to hit to cause some real pain. I've also heard you've got a fire affinity, same as me, which will be plenty of new fire style ninjutsu. I'm also pretty good with making poisons along with having an immunity to most of them. So I can definitely teach you lots of new things and ways to make your enemies hurt." Enko replied with a grin. 
Kuranai was hesitant and had many doubts about Anko training Hinata, so she asked, R. Are you really sure you'd want to train someone, Anko? Kuranai was genuinely afraid of Hinata turning into a miniature Anko when they saw the usually kind girl grinning cruelly, covered in snakes, and licking a kanai. Don't worry, Kuranai, I'll only break the bashful brat a little bit, just enough to make her stronger, Anko smirked wickedly at Hinata, who was forced to swallow. Hinata, not denying the opportunity to learn from Anko, grinned at the purplette, you, you, uh, uh, I, 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 if why, yo, you're sure, I'd really like that, Anko, sensei. Anko said, glad to hear it, now let's keep moving, there's no telling how many more ninja they have here, if they'll be able to delay the others. The others nodded in agreement and they started moving in the direction that the others were going. Anko then turned serious and focused back on the mission. With the retrieval team. As this was going on, the remainder of the retrieval team kept traveling through the forest in the direction of Takumi village and the ritual site. But it didn't take long for them to be compelled to halt and leap clear of the path as a strong gust of wind, piercing the trees with its sharp edge, blasted past them. Kujiku smirked at the ninja, waiting for the opportunity to kill them, and exclaimed, you foolish ninja won't be taking another step, as she whirled down from the sky. With a frown on her face, Kujiku allowed the three janin to pass, and Asuma said, pulling out his trench knives, a wind. User, huh. Looks like it's my turn then. Kakashi, Guy, Yamato, you go ahead, I'll be sure to make this quick. Kujiku became enraged at Asuma's remarks and exclaimed, don't even think this will be an easy fight, ninja. I'll cut you into pieces believing he was undermining her skills. After learning that Kazuma was still alive and what had happened to the fire temple, Asuma narrowed his eyes and said, Look lady, no offense to you or anything, but recently I've lost one of my best friends, learned something I really didn't want to know, and now a bunch of upstart blacksmiths want to play ninja by attacking my comrades. So sorry in advance, but this isn't a fight, it's me letting off my steam. Takumi Village's actions were merely the ideal pretext for him to strike something that could strike back. Kujiku exclaimed, How funny, this isn't a fight for me either, it's just killing an arrogant ninja. Great vacuum cannon. He was only more enraged that he hadn't thought of this as a fight before unleashing tiny, potent, and almost undetectable bursts of wind at the janin. Remember, this is what you requested. Fire style. Ash pile burning. Asuma exclaimed releasing a cloud of gunpowder infused with chakras and lighting it with the flint in his mouth to create a flaming explosion. With the retrieval team, the remaining Jonin continued through the trees until they noticed an armored figure with a large mace standing on a tree branch ahead of them. Guy exclaimed, leave this one to me, before springing forward and whirling around. Dynamic entry, Guy exclaimed as he launched a flying kick towards Suiko. Suiko grunted as the kick struck his infinite armor propelling him backward even as the armor absorbed the chakra from the kick. Suiko skidded across the ground as he landed, narrowing his eyes to see Guy land in front of him and take a stance as Kakashi and Yamato darted by. Suiko said, you're strong. She didn't realize there was actual strength in that kick, and Guy grinned at him. And you certainly seem like a durable fellow to remain standing after that kick. I also take that as the infinite armor. I could feel it drain the chakra from me even with that brief contact. Guy said while holding his mace tightly. You'll be feeling a lot more once I'm through with you, ninja! Suiko exclaimed, preparing for battle as he lunged at Guy while brandishing his mace. The janin narrowed his eyes. Asuma exclaimed, wind style, dust storm jutsu, and unleashed a burst of dust, filled wind towards Kujiku through his hands. Kujiku yelled, wind cutter jutsu, as she swung her swords and unleashed wind blades that tore through the wind stream and returned it toward Asuma. Asuma quickly dodged the wind blast by using substitution jutsu, then he reappeared behind Kujiku and used his trench knives to channel wind chakra in a lunge at the greenette. Kujiku took off, only for a whirlwind to envelop her as she rose into the sky. Kujiku grinned and turned to face Asuma, lowering her swords and lunging at him. Are you still letting off some steam ninja? Or are you getting worried? She exclaimed. Asuma swiftly blocked them, but as the chakra surrounding his knives dispersed, he mentally cursed and had to back away as Kujiku swung her blades at him. Kujiku let loose a hurricane at Asuma, saying, Wind return. The Jonin used another substitution to evade it. Worried? No annoyed? Very? 
Wind style. Great breakthrough! exclaimed Asuma, using hand signals to communicate before unleashing a fierce gust of wind that caused Kujiku to scoff and raise her swords. Kujiku swung her swords as the great breakthrough reached her, causing it to be redirected back at Asuma like a hurricane. Seems you still haven't learned. Wind return, she exclaimed. When Kujiku flew at him again, Asuma leapt out of the hurricane's path and raised his trench knives, smiling wickedly as she brought her swords down on top of him. Asuma narrowed his eyes and Kujiku exclaimed, Do you understand now, ninja? No matter what wind you use, I'll just send it right back at you. She discovered that, in addition to using her weaknessless flying shorts words to control the wind, she could also deflect wind-style ninjutsu attacks against her. When her swords came into contact with his knives, even his flying swallow became ineffective. Leaving Asuma to investigate whether her sword's power had a limit, they discovered that it didn't appear to have one. Asuma said, try redirecting this then. Fire style. Ash pile burning. And released a cloud of gunpowder infused with chakra, making the Takumi Kunoichi jump back. With a swing of her sword, Kujiku exclaimed, I've already seen that and it won't work again. Peacock whirlwind. And unleashed a strong gust of wind that blew the gunpowder away from her. Then try this. Fire style. Fire dragon bullet. Asuma exclaimed making hand signs before hurling a fire breath directly at the greenette, causing her to leap out of the way. Wind style. Gale Pong, Asuma exclaimed, circling back around to review hand signs and hurling one of his trench knives through the flames as he blew a strong gale in its direction. Causing the trench knife to swiftly slice through the air, setting off nearby fires as it went through the flames. Kujiku swiftly raised her swords as her eyes widened at the sight of the weapon aimed at her. Kujiku yelled, peacock whirlwind formation, and spun a wind vortex around herself. She was relieved that the trench knife was deflected before it could harm her. Only to let out a cry when Asuma swung his other trench knife at her back, using a shunshin to get behind her. Slashing Kujiku as she instantly took off, giving the janin a murderous glare. Kujiku yelled, you'll pay for that, ninja, great vacuum cannon, as he unleashed a tiny but potent, almost undetectable burst of wind toward Asuma. Asuma exclaimed, going through hand signs and hurling a cloud of gunpowder at the air blasts, fire style, ash pile burning. In partnership with Guy, when Suiko shouted and swung his mace at Guy, the Jonin leapt into the air, flipped over Suiko, and started spinning in the air. Severe leaf hurricane! exclaimed Guy as he spun around and kicked Suiko's back several times, causing the blacksmith to groan with each kick's force. Even more so, since he started kicking all over his body, Guy followed behind him and knocked him higher and higher into the air with each kick. Suiko was kicked low at his legs at first, then his chest, and lastly his chin, which propelled Suiko even higher. Still not stopping there, Guy leapt over Suiko and gave him a hard backslap with his heel, sending the Takumi ninja flying into the earth. Gritting his teeth, Suiko forced himself to stand, however, despite the infinite armor's capacity to heal wounds through chakra absorption, he was still suffering more injuries than it could handle. Even worse, he noticed that despite their repeated contacts and the infinite armor absorbing his chakra, Guy didn't even appear fatigued. Suiko became enraged that his armor didn't seem to be effective against Guy and demanded, How, how are you still standing? Your chakra should be drained with how many times you've touched my armor, so how can you still fight? I'm afraid that armor is rather useless against an opponent, like me. Guy exclaimed with a blinding smile further infuriating Suiko that he dare call the infinite armor useless. Because I am a pure taijutsu specialist, I've trained since before I was even a ninja, honing my physical abilities so that I can fight without chakra. The Konoha ninja became serious as Suiko swung his mace at Guy, extending his head in a flail, saying, you, arrogant ninja, I'll crush you. Guy produced a pair of nunchaku before Suiko could respond. They were connected by a twisted piece of cord, and each handle was red and carved to resemble a dragon. Like creature with scales running down its length and a head close to the base of the handle. These are the Soshuga, a pair of nunchaku gai that are utilized in battles where it is necessary to avoid making direct physical contact. Feeling that it was time to put them to use and put an end to this conflict. Guy let out a cry as he swung one of the nunchakus at the flail moments before it struck him. He did this several times around him. He dove under and around the flail, encircling it with his nunchaku as he spun and yanked it forward, dragging Suiko with it. Unable to control his movements, 
the Takumi ninja tore off from the ground and charged towards Guy, letting out a cry as the Jonin forcefully struck his face with his nunchaku. But Guy didn't stop there. He untangled his nunchaku from the flail and swung it around to encircle Suiko's neck with the cord, causing him to gasp in pain as his breathing was cut off. Guy swung the other nunchaku to wrap around Suiko's arms and body, restraining him. While I can respect those that fight for what they believe in, and one who fights to improve their village, you and the rest of Takumi village have attacked fellow Konoha ninja, plan to attack the other villages, to cause more pain and destruction, and for that I will fight to defeat you, Guy exclaimed. Then, releasing the handles, Guy spun and twisted his body, sending Suiko flying after he slammed his foot against his chin. Guy kicked the blacksmith higher and higher into the air, following his lead. Guy grabbed his nunchaku and yanked them once they were dozens of feet above the ground, releasing Suiko and sending him spinning through the air. To let out a cry when Guy started to rotate the nunchaku and force them to strike his body. I could feel his bones fracturing with every blow. His eyes grew wide as he experienced the breaking of the infinite armor straps, which allowed him to become entirely exposed. Suiko cried out, no, as he attempted to grab his armor before it collapsed, only to gasp when Guy encircled him with his nunchaku once more. Primary Lotus! exclaimed Guy, leaping back in time to see Suiko crash head, first into the earth, leaving a crater where his body momentarily stood before falling to the ground motionless. After determining that Suiko was dead by examining his body, Guy swiftly fled after Yamato and Kakashi, knowing that his opponents had been defeated. In company with Asuma, to her annoyance, Asuma exclaimed, fire style, ash pile burning, and let loose another cloud of gunpowder at Kujaku. With a swing of her sword, Kujaku exclaimed, haven't you realized that's useless? You won't be able to use it on me, peacock whirlwind? And unleashed a violent windstorm that destroyed the gunpowder. Asuma grinned and said, I don't know, it's annoying you, so I'd say it's working just fine. The greenette growled at the taunting. With a dramatic sword swing, Kujaku unleashed a powerful gust of wind, declaring, I'll enjoy having my wind cut you into pieces, rotating ferocious wind. We'll see. Fire style. Ash pile burning. Asuma exhaled and the gust of wind carried another cloud of gunpowder away. Kujaku instantly surrounded herself like a tornado and threw herself at Asuma, grinning wickedly. You're dead now. Wind cutter jutsu. Kujaku exclaimed, ready to slay him with her swords but the Jonin just gave her a smug look. Asuma gestured with her hand and said, you really should learn to watch your back. Wind style. Verdant mountain gale. The greenette's eyes widened before she swiftly turned around. She was shocked, though, when she saw the trench knife Asuma flung at her and how it sliced through the air directly in her direction. Peacock whirlwind. Kujaku exclaimed, relieved that she had managed to knock the trench knife away, as she swiftly swung her sword and let out a gust of wind. Got you. Fire style. Ash pile burning, Asuma exclaimed, covering Kujaku to her dismay with a cloud of gunpowder laced with chakra. Asuma swiftly leapt back over to a nearby river, took out his lighter, threw it at Kujaku, and proceeded to use hand signs. As soon as Asuma dove into the river, he exclaimed, Fire style. Flint Yagura Jutsu. As the lighter's flame burst into a massive, spiraling pillar of fire. Kujaku yelled, Peacock whirlwind formation, in the hopes of keeping herself safe, she spun a wind vortex around herself and blew the gunpowder away. Takumi Kunoichi, however, screamed in agony when the fire spread beyond igniting the gunpowder surrounding her. All of it that had been dispersed during the battle was set on fire by it, trapping Kujaku in a vast, exploding conflagration. Knowing that her wind would only fuel the flames, Kujaku's screams grew louder as the flames started to burn her body much to her increasing panic and fear. Just before she was reduced to ash, the greenette quickly channeled chakra to her swords and teleported away in a flash of green light. When the flames subsided, Asuma came to the surface of the water and scowled at the lack of any evidence of Kujaku or anything that would have survived the explosion. It must have been a different ability of those swords that let her get away, but even if she survives, I doubt she'll be in any condition to fight. Asuma thought to himself as he quickly gathered his trench knife and lighter and ran back to join the others. In company with Hoki. In the meantime, Hoki and the surviving Takumi ninja were almost done drawing out enough chakra to bring Seimei back to life. Then, when Ryugan and Kujaku materialized in green flashes and Ryugan was holding his broken arm from the snake bite, 
Their focus quickly shifted to them. Kujaku, whose whole body was charred, collapsed to her hands and knees. Hoki frowned and asked, what happened, at the state they were in? Ryugan scowled and said, the ninja proved to be more annoying than we thought, they had Uchiha and Hayuga with them, and the Uchiha took the chakra sabers. A few of the ninja appeared anxious or upset that Konoha now had the chakra sabers, which was made worse by the presence of Uchiha. Kujaku, whose burns prevented him from even standing up, exclaimed, I was nearly burned alive by one of those bastards. I was lucky to even be able to teleport away before I was turned to ash. Hearing this, Hoki scowled in rage, figuring that since Suiko hadn't come back, it was likely that he too was dead and that the ninja Ryugan had with him were all now dead. Hoki called for and put on the infinite armor, saying, then we need to hurry and revive Seimei. Sama before the ninja get here. We've come too far for them to stop us now. Refusing to let the ninja stop them when they're so close to resurrecting Seimei. Just as Kakashi and Yamato were about to leap through the trees in front of them, the Takumi ninja became tense. Some of the Takumi ninja became tense at the sight of the dojutsu as Kakashi lifted his headband and revealed his Sharingan. Sorry to disappoint you then, since no one will be getting revived. Not Seimei, and certainly none of you. Hoki grinned and said, I recognize you, you're Kakashi Hitaki the copy ninja. I'm sure killing you will show the rest of the hidden villages just how powerful Takumi village and our weapons are. He then swung his sword, unleashing a massive wave of flames that hit the Janin. Water style. Water formation wall, exclaimed Kakashi, passing through a series of hand signs before spouting a great deal of water and forming a wall of water that blocked the flames and produced a great deal of steam. As Kakashi charged through the steam with a kanai, several Takumi ninja charged forward to attack the ninja, only to be instantly cut down. Slashing the Takumi ninja as soon as they approached, using his Sharingan to deflect and block their blows. One of the ninja swung a broadsword at Kakashi's head, so he dropped into a crouch, stabbing his kanai into his stomach, then sweeping their legs out from under them and grabbing their sword when they dropped it. After the copy ninja spun around and blocked another ninja's hammer while using a genjutsu on them, Kakashi was able to slit their chest with the sword. Earth style. Earth flow spears. exclaimed Yamato as he slammed his hands down on the ground, breaking through hand signs and sending numerous stone spikes shooting up to impale the Takumi ninja. Holding his Garion sword in the other hand and channeling chakra to it, Ryugan exclaimed, your rocks won't stand up to my dragons, as the dragons emerged and charged forward, smashing through the spikes towards Yamato. Yamato made hand signs and exclaimed, I doubt you'll do much against this, wood style, smothering binding jutsu, as his arm transformed into wood and several tendrils shot out, entangling the dragons. Even people in Takumi village were aware of the legendary Keke Jenke of the Shodai Hokage, so Ryugan exclaimed, what? As he saw the Mokaton. The blue net then grunted as the wooden tendrils sped forward and ensnared him, his sword returning to normal with his chakra sealed away. Lightning style. Lightning beast tracking fang. Kakashi exclaimed, conjuring up a lightning beast and aiming it at Ryugan, who was terrified when he saw it approaching. Kujiku swung one of her swords, Peacock Whirlwind, causing a whirling gale that interfered with the lightning jutsu. You seem to forget that fire always beats wood, exclaimed Hoki, who then, much to Ryugan's relief, slashed apart the wooden tendrils binding him with his sword coated in fire. Kakashi shot a water jet at Hoki and exclaimed, then we'll just extinguish it, water style, water bullet jutsu. To his astonishment, a Takumi ninja brandishing a trident leapt in front of him, severing the water jet in two and aiming the jet of water back towards Kakashi and Yamato. With a slam of his hands on the ground, Yamato exclaimed, earth style, mud wall, and a stone wall rose up in front of him and Kakashi, obstructing the water. To the surprise of Kakashi and Yamato, a Takumi ninja brandishing a massive axe yelled, we have you ninja, now, as they swung the axe and split the stone wall in half. The two Janin had just gagged in agony when the ninja with the bows suddenly shot them with multiple arrows. Then two Takumi ninja charged forward, stabbing Yamato and Kakashi in the chest with their spears. The ninja grinned and exclaimed, Ha! Huh, not so tough now AR. Ah! Uh, but then let out a painful scream as Kakashi burst into a bolt of lightning. When Yamato turned out to be a wood clone with wooden spikes poking through the ninja, the ninja who had stabbed Yamato could only vomit and gasp. 
As Yamato went through the hand signs, he exclaimed, Wood style. Tree bind flourishing burial. This caused several trees to appear out of nowhere beneath several Takumi ninja, ensnaring and suffocating them once they were fully trapped. Lightning transmission! exclaimed Kakashi and a clone, who were both linked by a lightning stream to their rakery. The two charged towards the Takumi ninja brandishing a bow, severing each of them with the lightning beam. Hoki, furious at their allies the Konoha ninja have killed, swung his sword and let out a powerful blast of flames, exclaiming, R-A-A-A-A-H-H-H, you ninja will pay. You'll all burn. Rotating ferocious wind, Kujiku exclaimed as she swung her swords, causing a strong wind gust to strengthen Hoki's flames. Kakashi slammed his hands on the ground and yelled, Earth style, multi-mud wall, several stone walls rose up to obstruct the flames before they could be struck. Ryugan yelled, I'll tear you ninja to pieces, as he launched his dragons at the walls and focused a lot of chakra into his sword. You can try. Wood style, nativity of a sea of trees, exclaimed Yamato, making several trees rise up out of the ground to obstruct the dragons while using hand signs. As Hoki whirled his sword, a vortex of fire shot through the trees and broke through the stone walls, saying, the only thing you're doing is giving us more fuel for your pyres. The only reason the flames didn't reach Kakashi and Yamato was because they moved aside before they could, but the two Jonin saw the remaining Takumi ninja charging toward them. They became tense in anticipation, but as soon as the Takumi ninja approached closely enough, Kakashi and Yamato burst into petals of flowers. Many hidden shadow snake hands. Before the Takumi ninja could cry out, dozens of snakes erupted from the trees, encircling or sinking their fangs into their bodies to confine them. Fire style. Ash pile burning. The gunpowder cloud that engulfed them later caught fire and engulfed the Takumi ninja in a fiery explosion. Guy exclaimed, Leaf hurricane, as he suddenly materialized in the middle of five Takumi ninja and sent them all flying back with a spin kick. Together with Satsuki, Hanada, Kuranai, Anko, Asuma, and Guy, the remaining Takumi ninja and the now. Three celestial symbols men observed as Kakashi and Yamato made a comeback. Glad the rest of the retrieval team had shown up, Kakashi said, I take it you all dealt with your opponents. This would allow them to wrap up quickly. The lackeys we handled, but the blue brat with the mouth teleported away to save his own skin. Not that it'll matter soon enough, laughed Anko. Asuma expressed surprise that Kujiku was still alive and remarked, Looks like mine survived too, barely though. However, she didn't think Kujiku would be able to fight back. Where's Naruto? Satsuki yelled, giving the Takumi ninja a fierce look. Hanada exclaimed, he's in that dome, and they're siphoning his chakra. As she observed Naruto and her Baikugan inside the dome, his chakra being absorbed, but she also noticed something else going on with him. Sensing they had finally drawn enough chakra from the whiskered ravenette, Hoki grinned and said, that's right, and now, the time has finally come for Seimei, Sama to be revived. The retrieval teams were worried that Seimei was almost revived and they were just waiting for more time. Fire style. Grand fireball jutsu. Exclaimed Satsuki, directing the Takumi ninja with hand signs before hurling a massive fireball in their direction. Hanada exclaimed, lightning style, lightning ball, as she launched multiple lightning balls towards the Takumi ninja. Ryugan yelled, you brats won't interrupt our victory, as his dragons tore through the fireball and attacked the jutsu. Kujiku exclaimed, Seimei. Sama will return. Great vacuum cannon, as he launched multiple wind bursts that scattered the lightning balls. Shouting, Hoki stabbed his sword into the ground, dividing them from the retrieval team with a wall of fire. Water style. Water bowl. Exclaimed Yamato as he extended his hands to shoot a stream of water at the flames, putting them out. The retrieval team was only met with the Takumi ninja charging in with the intention of holding them off until Seimei is brought back to life. Severe Leaf Hurricane! Guy exclaimed, lunging forward and leaping to his feet before launching the ninja into the air with a devastating spin kick. Satsuki was swiftly moving forward, her Sharingan and Chakra Sabers activated, and she was swinging a mace beneath one of the ninja, almost severing them with one of her sabers. Before slicing another ninja down the shoulder and chest, he leapt up and over them with a spear. Swinging her swords at the Uchiha and unleashing waves of wind at her, Kujiku exclaimed, little girls shouldn't get in the way of grown-up business, windcutter jutsu. Satsuki exclaimed, 
and you should know when to quit. Fire style. Demon lanterns. As she unleashed a barrage of fireballs in the shape of ghost heads that were propelled toward her by Kujiku's winds. The greenette's eyes widened at the sight, and then she leapt back, screaming in agony as the ghost heads burst into a massive conflagration. Her body was scorched even more as she crashed into a tree. Ryugan yelled, Payback time, you little bai. Goth, as he rushed towards Satsuki. However, as Hanada abruptly spun around in front of him, he was struck in the back and gasped in pain. Before hitting two of Ryugan's tenketsu, Hanada exclaimed, You're within my range of division. Two palms, four palms, eight palms, sixteen palms. With a final blow to Ryugan's abdomen, Hanada exclaimed, Eight trigrams thirty. Two palms, and sent him flying back before he hit the ground, moaning in agony. Prior to turning towards Hoki, they discovered him standing before Seimei's coffin when the lid dropped, exposing Seimei's preserved body. Hoki exclaimed, You're too late, Seimei. Sama, let your spirit be revived as I offer up my body to complete your resurrection. Kakashi raced toward him, passing through hands and snatching his wrist. That's not happening, Rakuri, exclaimed Kakashi launching the attack to impale Hoki as lightning flared up in his hand. But it was too late. Hoki yelled as his body started to dissolve into light particles and fused with Seimei's, taking his fire sword and the infinite armor with it, before Kakashi and the others were thrown back by a chakra explosion. He rises, exclaimed a Takumi ninja with the others, rejoicing to see their leader come back to life. Asuma questioned, Kakashi, what's happening? As they covered their faces and the wind started to rippling around Seimei's coffin, his body glowing brightly. With the knowledge that they had utilized the chakra of not only an Uzumaki Jinchuriki but also whatever other power Naruto possessed, Kakashi exclaimed, I don't know. But be prepared, there's no telling what Seimei will be like or how strong. Satsuki and Hinata were the ones who were most alarmed as the retrieval team started to hear Naruto screaming inside the metal dome. When his screams seemed to turn into roars, their concern only grew. Before the winds and glow subsided and everyone could see Seimei's resurrected form, they were all taken aback by his appearance. Seimei appeared to have pale skin, long, wavy, pure white hair that grew in a wavy pattern around his forehead and eyes like black and gray fur, pale green eyes with slits in the pupils, and black claws on his hands. The most startling features were the white wolf tail that protruded from his tailbone, the white wolf ears perched atop his head, and the fact that his legs were entirely covered in white fur and resembled beasts with long, elongated claws. He was dressed in an open, high, colored black robe that revealed his muscular chest and was adorned with gray tribal tattoos. The robe's sleeves had openings along them that were tucked into the bronze shoulder pieces, black and black bracers he wore around his wrists, and bronze chains that ran up the front of the robe and around his upper arms. A large black band with bronze trimming around his waist, a white cloak covering his lower half, and a translucent white fabric hanging from his shoulders that reached down to his feet with bronze tassels hanging from them all adorned his white collar with bronze trimming. Everyone was shocked to see him, especially the Takumi ninja because he didn't resemble Seimei at all as the records had claimed. Say, Say, Seimei, Sama, Ryugan questioned in disbelief, and Seimei quickly regained consciousness and glanced at himself. Seimei exclaimed, shocked at his appearance and unable to recognize any remnants of his previous appearance. What? What has happened? Why have I been revived in such a state? After learning that Naruto was a Jinchuriki during the ritual, Kujiku exclaimed, The boy, he's an Uzumaki, and a Jinchuriki, he's the one we used to revive you Seimei. Sama, his chakra must have done it, realizing that Naruto's chakra was the reason for this. Furthermore, the fact that Todose trained him implied that he was an Uzumaki as well. An Uzumaki Jinchuriki. That certainly explains why I feel so powerful. The Kiyubi and the chakra of an Uzumaki are now mine. Seimei grinned wickedly, clenching his fists and expressing how much more powerful he felt than in his previous life. As the retrieval team prepared to bury him, Kakashi exclaimed, Don't get used to it, Seimei. Because we're sending you back to the Pure Lands. Right now, Seimei looked at them. As the Fire Sword, Infinite Armor, Garion Sword, and Weaknessless Soaring Shorts words flew towards him, Seimei exclaimed, It seems ninja are still as arrogant as they were a hundred years ago. But I suppose you'll be good test subjects to see the extent of my new strength. Be honored that you'll be the first victims of the ultimate weapon, before making hand signs. 
The Garion sword was behind him, its three prongs extending and circling him, the infinite armor was on his chest, the fire sword was tucked into a slot on its forehead, and the soaring short's words combined with two of the straps on the infinite armor. Seimei floated in the air on one, and the three green orbs in the swords were removed and expanded into orbs of chakra around him. Creating ten blue fireballs, Satsuki yelled, we'll see how ultimate you are as a pile of ash. Fire style. Foxfire. Before launching them towards Seimei. As one of the prongs of the Garion sword transformed into a dragon and sent a strong windstorm that slammed into fireballs, Seimei uttered the words, Peacock Whirlwind. Satsuki was taken aback, though, when the wind pushed the fireballs back and ignited them into a fiery vortex that was now directly approaching her, instead of strengthening them. Earth style. Mud wall. Yamato exclaimed, slamming his hands onto the ground and making hand signs before erecting a stone wall in front of Satsuki to stifle the flames. The Ravenette immediately used a substitution to keep herself from being reduced to ash, but the Inferno still managed to smash straight through the wall. Fire style. Flame whirlwind. Exclaimed Hanada as she unleashed a fireball that spiraled around her and directly toward Seimei. With a blast of wind, Kakashi exclaimed, wind style, great breakthrough, igniting Hinata's flames. With a quick glance at the combined jutsu, Seimei caused another dragon to materialize and open its mouth. With a sly smile, it started consuming the flames as the infinite armor took in the chakra from them. Dynamic entry, exclaimed Guy, lunging skyward and kicking Seimei with such force that he was startled when the ultimate weapon caught his foot without even flinching. Seimei grinned and said, it seems I'm also physically stronger as well. Meanwhile, one of the soaring short's words swiftly deflected Asuma's trench knives and took the chakra from them. Peacock whirlwind formation, declared Seimei, just before a wind vortex erupted around him, sending Guy and Asuma hurtling backward. Holding his arm out to Seimei, Yamato exclaimed, wood style, great forest jutsu, as a plethora of wooden tendrils extended to entangle him. Seimei uttered the words, great vacuum cannon, unleashing dozens of wind blasts that smashed straight through Yamato's wooden tendrils and sent the Jonin crashing into a tree with an agonized grunt. Prior to Seimei looking down, he noticed roots enveloping his body and growing beneath him, eventually tying him to a tree. Kuranai let out a cry when her genjutsu broke, only for the prongs of the Garion sword to transform into dragons and bite into the tree. Seimei said, foolish mistake using genjutsu, when the infinite armor simply absorbs the chakra in it in you. After causing Kuranai's body to be torn apart by the dragons, the Genjutsu mistress's body disintegrated into snakes that made a lunge towards Seimei. Only to have Seimei's body consumed by flames, leaving them reduced to ash. As the fire surrounding him abruptly burst into a massive firestorm that raced forward to engulf the ninja and force them to retreat, Seimei uttered the words, rotating ferocious wind. I need to move quickly. Kakashi thought as he started quickly leafing through the several dozen hand signs. Water style. Great waterfall jutsu. Kakashi exclaimed, hurling copious amounts of water at the flames as the two strikes collided and a substantial wall of steam was produced. Fire style. Ash pile burning. Exclaimed Asuma, in an attempt to engulf Seimei in a cloud of gunpowder infused with chakras. Fire style. Dragon fire jutsu. Exclaimed Anko unleashing a jet of flame that struck the gunpowder and engulfed Seimei in flames. To their dismay, the retrieval teams looked up to see Seimei floating in the air atop the chakra orb and said, you're all too slow. I feel like I've been protecting for too long, now it's my time to attack, Seimei uttered with a menacing smirk as the three dragon heads materialized and then grew even bigger than before. As two of the dragons let out dozens of blasts of wind and the third let out a massive stream of fire, Seimei exclaimed, great vacuum cannon. The wind was blowing through the flames, causing enormous, fast, moving fireballs to shoot down toward the ninja. As Yamato started to construct innumerable wooden branches that grew and interlocked into a wall resembling a net, he exclaimed, wood style, world of trees wall, and grunted as the fireballs started to crash into it. Guy exclaimed, gate of opening, open, as he opened the first gate and quickly vanished. Making a sudden reappearance in front of Seimei, he caused the ultimate weapon to widen his eyes. Prior to groaning as Guy kicked him even higher into the air, the green beast kicked Seimei even higher as a follow-up. When they reached a sufficient altitude, 
Guy disappeared with yet another rush of velocity, emerging from behind Seimei as he encircled him with his arms and started to rotate them. As they dove back to the earth, Guy exclaimed, Let's see how you handle this, primary lotus. However, as they got closer to the ground, Guy felt the infinite armor rapidly draining his chakra, which caused him to curse and rush to try freeing Seimei, only to let out a cry as the dragons from the Garian swords bit into his body, further depleting his chakra. Seimei took charge of the attack and drained Guy's chakra, saying, Let's see how you handle it, ninja. Seimei turned them around as they got near enough to the ground, then sent Guy flying into the wooden wall, smashing through it with the help of his dragons. With a swift motion, Seimei unleashed dozens of wind blades that sliced through the wooden wall and dismembered the ninja, uttering the words, Windcutter Jutsu. When the ninja all turned into flower petals and saw that they had genjutsu, Seimei scowled in irritation. Anko exclaimed, Many hidden shadow snake hands, as she launched dozens of snakes at Seimei through her sleeves. However, he once more engulfed his body in flames, destroying the snakes in the process. Kakashi unleashed a lightning beast that lunged towards Seimei, saying, Lightning style, lightning beast tracking fang. Peacock whirlwind, declared Seimei, causing one of the dragons to unleash a furious windstorm that caused the lightning beast to become unstable and collide with the copy ninja, feeling him take off again. Yamato exclaimed, Wood style, tree bind flourishing burial, and built a tree beneath Seimei in an attempt to trap and kill him. However, the dragons tore the tree apart as they took the chakra out of it. Satsuki exclaimed, pulling out some shuriken and hurling them at Seimei while energizing them with fire chakra. Fire style, phoenix sage flower nail crimson. Hanada yelled, lightning style, electric shock needles, as she produced several lightning needles to throw at Seimei. Peacock whirlwind formation. Seimei uttered, engulfing himself in a wind vortex that quickly expanded into a massive hurricane that destroyed the lightning needles and sent shuriken flying all over the place. The shuriken were so fast at slicing through the air that the ninja were forced to dodge, causing them to grunt in agony, only to quickly discover that the hurricane surrounding Seimei was lifting them off the ground. Saying, Great Vacuum Cannon, Seimei unleashed a barrage of wind blasts from the hurricane that struck the ninja, sending some of them screaming in pain. Gate of healing. Open. Gate of life. Open, exclaimed Guy, opening the following two gates as a green chakra aura surrounded him, his skin turning red, and his hair floating upward. Severe leaf hurricane. Exclaimed Guy, who then abruptly materialized inside the hurricane and spun Seimei out of it with a spin kick. Guy then materialized behind the ultimate weapon, slamming his knee into Seimei's back and sending him flying. With the Soshuga drawn, the Jonin started to move too quickly for anyone to follow, blitzing around Seimei and hitting him in the air with his nunchaku repeatedly. Guy yelled, Gate of Pain! Open! As he opened the next gate and gained even more speed, which let him hit Seimei even more quickly. The ultimate weapon clenched his teeth in response to the more powerful blows, sensing that even though the infinite armor is mending him with the chakra it has absorbed, he is still suffering injuries more quickly than it can repair. Until, at last, Guy kicked Seimei hard, sending him flying, and then he wrapped his nunchaku around Seimei's frame. Hidden Lotus! exclaimed Guy as he and Seimei dove to the ground and gritted their teeth against the Garian sword dragons biting into his body once more. Peacock Whirlwind Formation! exclaimed Seimei, encircling himself in a vortex that allowed the wind to sever Guy's body, forcing the green beast to numb the agony in order to defeat Seimei. He could not contain his cries of pain as Seimei set the whirlwind ablaze, causing his body to burn in addition to the wind slicing him. Fortunately, the fiery vortex quickly came to an end as they crashed into the ground, leaving everyone to see who was still standing through the smoke. While Guy was having difficulty standing, Seimei was getting back up, shocking the retrieval team with his quick healing of all his wounds. With all three dragons aimed at Guy, Seimei said, that was certainly a powerful attack, if it had been anyone else you might have succeeded in killing them, unfortunately, you're up against me. Great vacuum cannon. Then, he let loose a torrent of wind blasts at the green beast. With every blow, Guy let out a gasp and let out a grunt of pain, which propelled him back into the air where Kakashi caught him before he hit the ground. Seimei uttered these words as two of his dragons shot out blasts of flame and the third unleashed gale force winds. Now you ninja can burn. Rotating ferocious wind. 
As the three combined to create enormous blasts of fire that were directly aimed at the retrieval team, Kakashi had to put Guy down before he and Yamato exchanged hand signs. Water style. Water formation wall. Exclaimed Yamato and Kakashi as they launched water jets into the air, creating a substantial wall of water in front of them. Grunting. They watched as the blaze crashed into the water wall and started vaporizing it before they could escape. Forcing the Jonin to try and maintain the jutsu until the fire goes out by channeling more chakra into it. How is he so strong? When Seimei was alive, I had never heard of him possessing such power. Is it genuinely because they utilized the Kiyubi and Naruto's chakras? Having the chakra of an Uzumaki, or even a Biju, a half. Uzumaki, and Naruto's power. Is he the only one doing this? If that's the case, Seimei must have developed sufficient strength to match a cage. I have to come up with something quickly. Observing how the flames were beginning to breach the water wall, Kakashi thought to himself. The copy ninja had no idea that his Sharingan was changing as the Tomos started to change shape and pin around the pupil. Before long, the pupil was encircled by three triangles that resembled a pinwheel. The retrieval team was taken aback when a swirling distortion materialized in front of them sucking up the flames inside of it, and Kakashi felt a sharp pulse pass through his Sharingan. Before the flames were completely absorbed, Kakashi and Yamato were able to lower the water wall. Prior to that, they witnessed Kakashi collapsing as he realized how little chakra he had left from, well, whatever he appeared to be doing. Senpei! exclaimed Yamato, catching Kakashi just in time to prevent him from falling to the ground as the others hurried over to investigate. Seimei declared, I don't know how you did that, but it seems you won't be doing it again. Great vacuum cannon. The dragons then unleashed dozens of wind blasts that tore straight through the ninja, only for them to explode into flower petals, making him scowl in frustration. Until Seimei's frown deepened and he realized that they were attempting to catch him in a genjutsu once more as he saw the flower petals swirling around him quickly. Only to snarl in response to something severing his cheek, revealing weapons concealed in the petals. Peacock Whirlwind Formation, Seimei uttered, conjuring a wind vortex to eject any weaponry they attempted to hurl at him. Asuma exclaimed, Fire style, ash pile burning, as she let loose a puff of gunpowder that caused the hurricane to draw in and swirl around Seimei. Anko exclaimed, Fire style, dragon fire jutsu, as he shot a stream of flames that ignited the gunpowder and engulfed Seimei in a massive blast. Only for Seimei to be abruptly blown away from the explosion, however, before he could launch an attack, the ultimate weapon became entangled in several string bean vines and was propelled skyward. In front of him, a sizable bean pod rose up and opened, revealing Kuranai inside. While Kuranai's body was being bit by Seimei's dragons, she erupted into snakes that lunged towards him, saying, I've already said such illusions are useless against me. When Seimei realized the vines were actually dozens of snakes injecting him with venom and poison, he gritted his teeth. He was only able to return to the ground when Seimei covered his body in flames and turned the snakes into ash. Anko exclaimed, Too bad for you, this is real now. Fire style. Flaming hail. As the dragons ate the arrows and the chakra that had been used to make them. The burning remains of the snakes had transformed into fire arrows that rained down on Seimei. The ultimate weapon was propelled skyward as the ground beneath Seimei abruptly gave way, exposing a massive snake that was ready to eat him. He released bursts of fire to burn the snake while directing his dragons toward it. However, Seimei was startled to feel someone grab his head from behind and the infinite armor absorb an appallingly repulsive chakra. Anko exclaimed, and unfortunately for you, you just pissed me off. Fire style. Hiding in Ashjutsu as he unleashed a massive cloud of ash infused with fire chakra directly onto Seimei, scorching him instantly upon contact. Seimei, gritting his teeth against the burning sensation on his body and the disgusting chakra the infinite armor was absorbing, spun a vortex around himself to cut into the purple its body. Anko, however, leapt backward before the wind could reach her. Seimei exclaimed, Wind Cutter Jutsu, as she spun around and swung the soaring short's words at Anko, unleashing a number of wind blades that she managed to dodge by using substitution jutsu to quickly land back on the ground. Seimei notices that Anko is now glaring at him murderously and that black markings have taken over her left half of her body. With Gai and Kakashi both out of commission due to his immense power, the Tokabetsu Jonin had no choice but to reluctantly use her curse seal to give herself a boost. 
something that now had her more than ready to murder him for pressuring her to carry out the last action she had ever desired. Anko yelled, fire style, flame capture, as he produced a fire whip and threw it at Seimei. Seimei yelled, peacock whirlwind, and caused one of the dragons to unleash a fierce gust of wind that blew away the whip and caused the whirlwind to erupt into flames as it struck the purplette. But when she suddenly erupted into flower petals that shot themselves at him, Seimei grimaced in irritation. Said Seimei swung the soaring short's words, releasing a strong wind that blew the petals away as they stabbed into trees, revealing they were shuriken. Rotating ferocious wind, she exclaimed. Wind style. Verdant mountain gale, Asuma exclaimed, slicing through Seimei's whirlwind with his trench knives before they were stopped by the soaring short's words. Anko yelled, many hidden shadow snake hands, as she threw dozens of snakes at Seimei out of her sleeves. Satsuki exclaimed, fire style, demon lanterns, as she launched several fireballs shaped like ghost heads in Seimei's direction. Fire style, fox fire, exclaimed Hanada as she launched ten blue fireballs at Seimei, causing them to turn blue as a result of their combination with the ghost heads. Yamato exclaimed, wood style, smothering binding jutsu, as his arm transformed into wood and several tendrils shot skyward, entangling Seimei. Seimei scowled as he was caught in the tendrils and the barrage of attacks aimed at him, his frustration mounting at the ninja's inability to accept their inevitable demise. Seimei roared, enough, and the dragons joined him in blasting sonic blasts that tore apart the wooden tendrils entangling him. It also unleashed a tremendous windstorm that hit the recovery team with a piercing shriek. The wind whipped across their bodies, sending them flying through the air and making them all cry out. Now burn, exclaimed Seimei causing all three of the dragon heads to erupt in flames. This transformed the cyclone into an enormous conflagration, scorching the retrieval team in addition to cutting them with the wind. Seimei continued the attack until it was eventually stopped, causing the ninja to fall to the ground and struggle before collapsing. With a menacing smirk, the ultimate weapon gazed down at his vanquished adversaries as it floated to the ground, only for it to turn into a sinister grin as Seimei started howling with laughter. Seimei laughed, rejoicing in his new, unstoppable power, certain that no one would be able to stand against him. Ahahahahahahahahahahahahahahahahahahahahahahahahahahahahahahahahahahahahahahahahahahahahahahahahahahahahahahahahahahahahahahahahahahahahahahahahahahahahahahahahahahahahahahahahahahahahahahahahahah
Aku, with a silver hilt, gray wrappings, and a short chain protruding from the end, giving it the appearance of an enormous kyber knife. The blade itself, however, was a trench knife. Like black blade with a silver edge that extended over the hilt and curled inward slightly near the tip. The Duke Wolf narrowed his eyes as Zen. Aku got up and hoisted Zanjetsu up onto his shoulder. He then peered around, seeing Seimei standing opposite him and the Konoha ninja on the ground. Seimei questioned Zen. Aku about the ultimate weapon for a short while before pointing Zanjetsu at him. And who are you supposed to be? Seimei demanded. Zen. Aku proclaimed, I am Zen. Aku, and I'll be the one sending you back to the Pure Lands. Seimei grimaced as the two stared down at one another. Gritting his teeth, Naruto swung his sword and it clashed with Zanjetsu's before the sentient sword turned and twisted around him. Shoving Naruto aside and striking the whiskered ravenette in the chest with the blade's hilt, causing Naruto to gasp in shock. Zanjetsu flipped his sword up to sever Naruto, but before Naruto could react, he hurriedly rushed after him and thrust his sword. Self at him. Zanjetsu's blade was deflected upward and into the air by Naruto, who raised his blade to block it and held it at an angle. Zanjetsu swiftly leaned back to avoid the slash as the whiskered ravenette seized the opportunity to swing his blade at him. Zanjetsu was just about to dodge the sentient blade when Naruto suddenly turned his sword around and swung it back at him, surprising him and severing a few of his hair in the process. Unfortunately, Zanjetsu delivered a wide swing at Naruto's side, forcing the Uzumaki to back off before he could celebrate finally landing a hit. He lifted his blade to deflect the next blow that came down. Zanjetsu flipped his grip and smashed his sword's hilt right into Naruto's face causing him to grit his teeth in pain and send his creator reeling back. Zanjetsu was on him once more, holding onto his reverse grip as he started rapidly swinging his sword, leaving Naruto with no time to recover. Forcing the genin to retreat in order to keep from getting cut, and stopping several near, misses with his own blade. Before leaping up and dodging Zanjetsu's subsequent blow to his legs, Naruto yelled, What's the point of this? You say something's holding me back? That I need to embrace what I've become? Well I have. I'm the Duke Wolf now, I'm Zen. Aku, what else is there? Before gagging, the Uzumaki crashed through a tree when Zanjetsu slammed his foot into his abdomen. He rolled out of the way, avoiding Zanjetsu's sword as it stabbed into the tree, not having time to heal. Zanjetsu retorted, slicing through the tree to free his katana form and charging the genin, you are lying to me and to yourself. You might have inherited his title and name, but you are not Zen. Aku, he knew what he was, embraced what he was and never pretended to be anything else, but you continue to lie and pretend. Pushing Zanjetsu back with his sword raised to deflect the slash, Naruto leapt into the air and turned the sentient sword over. He swiftly spun around and attempted to slit Zanjetsu across his back, but Zanjetsu blocked the blow by holding his blade behind him. He then turned around and knocked Naruto's sword aside. The Uzumaki swore as he slashed him across the chest, sending him reeling back. Then, as Zanjetsu swung his blade, can I at least get a damn hint? Naruto exclaimed, bending backward and barely avoiding losing his head. The Uzumaki lowered himself into a crouch, threatening to strike Zanjetsu's chest with his sword as he did so. When Zanjetsu blocked his thrust with his own katana, his eyes widened in surprise. Prior to the sentient blade lunging and swiveling his weapon around Naruto's own, the whiskered ravenette hissed as the blade sliced through his cheek. Zanjetsu said, leaping back as Naruto shot up and swung his sword at him, you already have all the answers you need. You just refuse to admit what you already know to be true. Naruto charged at Zanjetsu, swinging his sword furiously in frustration. What more do I need to know? I know who and what I am. How about you just give me an actual answer instead of talking in riddles, he exclaimed. Zanjetsu, on the other hand, avoided every blow from the Uzumaki with lightning speed, hardly moving as he did so. This only served to irritate the Uzumaki further. Up until Naruto let out a cry and directed all of his chakra into his sword. Before Naruto swung the blade at Zanjetsu, it quickly condensed around the tip, unleashing a powerful wave of chakra. Zanjetsu swung his sword faster than Naruto could see, slicing right through his own sword as he brought it down, even though Naruto's eyes widened before he could react. Zanjetsu pointed his sword at the genin's neck, causing him to tense as he stared at his shattered weapon in shock. Zanjetsu said, Fear. What holds you back, is fear. 
Naruto flinched a little and then glared at the sentient sword. Zanjetsu remained unflinching as Naruto snarled, I'm not afraid of anything. Zanjetsu said, lowering his blade as it disappeared, yes you are. I know everything you wish to keep hidden away, every secret, every dark corner of your mind, I know it all. And what you fear is knowing that you are no longer fully human. Zanjetsu said, you know it as well as I do, the moment you merged with Zen. Aku, a being that wasn't human himself. He was an org, a breed of demons. That is the truth you refuse to accept is that when you merged with Zen. Aku, you ceased to be fully human. You became half. Org, half. Demon. Naruto didn't respond, but flinched again at his words. The whiskered ravenette shook a little as Zanjetsu spoke. If you wish to unlock the full power of Zen. Aku, to be able to turn into that form at will, and to awaken my true power then you must accept what you have become and embrace it. Before Zanjetsu began swinging his sword at him once more, forcing him to retreat, Naruto attempted to deflect his blows with the remnants of his own blade. Just to keep retreating as Zanjetsu moved closer to him. Zanjetsu asked, curious as to whether Naruto would accept who he had become, what will be then? Will you finally accept what's happened, what you now are? Or will you keep clinging to the lie you've been telling yourself since the moment you put on that mask? Tell me, what are you? When he was too slow to parry the sentient sword's blow across his arm, the Uzumaki let out a grunt and leapt back to create some space between them. Nevertheless, Zanjetsu drew nearer and struck Naruto with his sword. Which he attempted to block with the hilt of his broken sword, clenching his teeth. You make it seem so simple, however, it's not, knowing in his heart that Zanjetsu was telling the truth about everything, Naruto pondered. He always told himself that he was still the same and that he was still human, even though he knew that the moment he and Zen. Aku merged, he was no longer human. But despite his strong desire to believe it, he was aware that it was just another delusion he had been telling himself in the vain hope that one day he would come to believe it. Naruto simply refused to acknowledge that he was now half. Org and half. Demon and that the villagers' accusations about him would come to pass. I'm still hearing how they regarded him like an outcast, a demon, a plague, or a monster. He's now turned into the person they've always claimed he was, and it's difficult to accept that. Zanjetsu pushed his sword down harder, making Naruto grit his teeth. You claim to no longer care what the villagers think of you, yet now it matters. What is it then, do you not care how they see you anymore or are you still so desperate to earn their respect and recognition? Zanjetsu demanded. Pushing Zanjetsu back, Naruto yelled, because I don't want to prove them right, and sent the sentient sword skidding back. My entire life they hated me, they were scared of me. Whispering behind my back, telling kids to avoid me, looking at me like I was already a demon. Now, now I'm everything they said I was. They, they'll be right, even if I don't do anything, they'll still be right. Claiming they always knew I was a monster, that I'm just showing what I always was, maybe I'd gain all of Zen. AKU's power and awaken yours, but I'll still end up alone when everyone finds out. Naruto said, his anger beginning to subside, causing him to feel uneasy. Sincerely, he didn't give a damn about what the villagers thought of him, but he also didn't want to disprove their assertion that they had always known he was a monster. Furthermore, he was averse to witnessing the responses of people he genuinely holds dear. Kakashi. Sensei, Yamato. Sensei even with his Mokaton and the fact it was kept secret from me, Yugo. Sensei, Uruka. Sensei, Kanoka Moegi and Udon, Tuchi and Ayame, Hanada, Fu and, Satsuki. You think it's so easy, but what happens when they find out I'm no longer fully human? Naruto replied. He was not concerned about the villagers' response, rather, he was annoyed by their arrogant demeanor, giving the impression that they had been, right all along, and that he was a demon. He is genuinely afraid of seeing the reactions of the people he cared about, though. You forget, Fu is a Jinchuriki herself, do you believe she would care when she's been treated as a demon her entire life, just as you? Most of them are also old enough to have known you were a Jinchuriki yet they have done nothing against you, before or now. Satsuki and Hinata still accepted you even after learning about the Kiyubi. And do you really believe Kanoka, Moegi and Udon will care either? After how they got to know you, how they look up to you? Zanjetsu said, causing Naruto to tighten. Naruto felt as though the Duke Wolf was still judging him when he glanced at his broken sword and saw his reflection there transforming into Zen, Aku. Holding the sword tightly as it started to restore itself, 
Naruto spoke, abandon your fear. Look forward, move forward and never stop. You'll age if you pull back. You'll die if you hesitate. Zanjetsu spoke. Knowing Zanjetsu was correct, Naruto declared, I'm not human. I am an org. I am a demon. If that's what people want to call me, then so be it, and accepted his new identity. Zanjetsu exclaimed, Now shout out my name, as red and black chakra erupted from the sword and encircled Naruto. Naruto exclaimed, Pierce the heavens, as the chakra engulfed him. The real world. When Naruto returned to the real world, his eyes burst open and began to glow gold. He saw that Zanjetsu's body was still attempting to breach the metal dome, so he grabbed hold of him tightly. This caused Zanjetsu's body to fill with black and red chakra, changing him until Zen. Aku eventually took his place. Zanjetsu. Zen. Aku cried out, slicing Zanjetsu through the air as it changed into a much bigger sword next to him. He released a strong blast of chakra, causing the dome to explode. He briefly dropped to one knee in order to catch his breath. The Duke Wolf experienced a surge of power that was far stronger than when he first transformed to battle Ryujin, giving him the impression that he could wipe out an entire continent at will. With the knowledge that he still needed to deal with the Takumi Ninja, he stood up and lifted Zanjetsu onto his shoulder. With the intention of eradicating both them and their entire village, he halted to consider his surroundings. Zen. Aku became even more enraged at the sight of his teammates, instructors, and other Jonin lying on the ground. That is, until he turned to see Seimei standing opposite him, feeling his own strength within the ultimate weapon. Seeing now who his team was attacked by and probably the one the Takumi ninja used to revive him. Seimei questioned Zen. Aku about the ultimate weapon. For a short while before pointing Zanjetsu at him. And who are you supposed to be? Seimei demanded. Zen. Aku proclaimed, I am Zen. Aku. And I'll be the one sending you back to the Pure Lands. Seimei grimaced as the two stared down at one another. Really? You think you can send me to the Pure Lands? Seimei asked, certain that he could simply dispatch this beast and any other ninja who stood in his way. Seimei was even more infuriated when Zen, Aku said, I don't think, I know by the end of this, you'll be begging for death. Wondering where the Uzumaki had disappeared to and what this wolf, like creature was, Kujiku exclaimed, what is that thing? Where did that stupid kid go? Thinking their leader could handle some brad trying to act tough, Ryugan said, that must be the brad, it's probably just some shinobi trick to make him look scary. Seimei. Sama won't even need to try to kill him. Unbeknownst to all, Satsuki moaned as she started to awaken, but her eyes widened upon seeing Zen. Aku standing opposite Seimei. She was shocked to discover how much his chakra resembled Naruto's. Prior to the Ravenette recalling his words, he told Hinata and Fu about the mask and its effects on him. The Uchiha, however, was astounded to see it for herself and realized just how strong Naruto was in this form. Naruto. Satsuki muttered in wonder and fear because, although she can sense his strength, she is unsure if it will be sufficient to defeat Seimei and his weaponry. Peacock Whirlwind. It seems like ninja are always conceited. The only people who will be sent to the Pure Lands are you, your allies, and every other ninja alive. Seimei exclaimed commanding one of his dragons to unleash a strong gust of wind and another to shoot out a stream of flames. When the two joined forces to create a tremendous conflagration that streaked in Zen, AKU's direction, the Duke Wolf suddenly disappeared. Zen. Aku exclaimed, you'll die trying, as he reappeared above Seimei and brought Zanjetsu down on him. However, as he did so, the third dragon head lashed out and bit down on the sword, draining Zen. AKU's chakra in the process. Sensing Seimei's weakness, Zen. Aku employed a substitution, surfacing directly behind him to stab Zanjetsu in the ground, then spin around it to slam his foot into Seimei's back. He launched the ultimate weapon into the air, stopping in mid-air to spin a whirlwind around himself. Seimei exclaimed, Wind Cutter Jutsu, as he swung the soaring shorts words at the changed Uzumaki, unleashing a barrage of incredibly sharp wind blades. As the wind blades sprang toward him, Zen. Aku dove to avoid them and then focused chakra into his sword to launch himself towards Seimei. With a shout, he unleashed a wave of chakra towards the ultimate weapon. With a Zanjetsu swing, but the dragon heads opened up to take the hit. With a menacing smile, Seimei absorbed the chakra and said, Thank you for the power, 
now burn. Before commanding all three dragons to release waves of flame that engulfed Zen, Aku. After slashing Seimei across his arm and flipping Zanjetsu around to sever his chest open, Zen. Aku materialized above him, causing Seimei to cry out. Seimei yelled, Peacock Whirlwind Formation, as he swiftly spun a vortex around himself that blew Zen, Aku away. You can't run forever, exclaimed Zen. Aku as he released multiple waves of chakra at the ultimate weapon, by swinging his sword and channeling more energy into it. Seimei scowled in resentment at the insult and said, I don't run from anything, let alone some arrogant ninja. Great vacuum cannon. Before ordering the dragons to launch dozens of wind blasts at the Duke Wolf. When Zen. Aku saw the blasts of wind coming his way, he used a substitution, and as he reappeared on the ground, the blasts tore apart the log. All right. So he has control over wind and fire in addition to being able to absorb chakra through those dragons. His wounds appear to be healing, though I'm not sure if that's a result of the power he took from me or another feature of those weapons. Zen. Aku sheathed Zanjetsu on his back and thought, let's see what else he can do then, as well as what limits he has. Zen. Aku exclaimed, Shadow Clone Jutsu, as he produced 20 clones, startling Seimei before he grinned broadly. As the dragons roared and unleashed a strong whirlwind towards Zen, Aku and his clones, Seimei exclaimed, So, you can use Tobarama Senju's Shadow Clone Jutsu and to be able to create so many, yet you don't even look winded. Once I take the rest of your power, I'll truly be unstoppable, rotating ferocious wind. Five of them charged at Seimei, using another substitution to evade the whirlwind while the other clones all moved aside. Upon unleashing waves of chakra towards the ultimate weapon, and swinging their swords, everyone was devoured by the dragons. With great anticipation, Seimei exclaimed, you're just giving me more power, as the clones continued to shoot chakra waves at him. A clone exclaimed, then let's see how you like this, as five more materialized behind Seimei, charging him and brandishing swords. Seimei yelled, Peacock Whirlwind Formation, and spun a vortex around himself, driving the clones away. The ultimate weapon was surrounded by a fiery vortex as the remaining ten clones leapt into the air above Seimei and began channeling fire chakra into their blades. One of the clones exclaimed, Your turn to burn, as the clones started to unleash waves of fire at the weapon. The clones were engulfed and destroyed by the vortex, which unexpectedly burst out, revealing Seimei was unharmed. Do you see now? There's nothing you can. Seimei exclaimed, only to have a clone erupt from the earth, severing his abdomen with a sword swing. Seimei scowled with rage and ordered one of his dragons to bite the clone in order to absorb its chakra and dispel it. A clone exclaimed, now take this, as six more materialized, each of them swinging a sword and hurling wind blades at Seimei. Saying, wind return, Seimei swung the soaring short's words, causing the wind blades to be deflected like a hurricane and destroy the clones in the process. Not before five more clones erupted from the earth all around Seimei, and they all started howling loudly at him right away. The force behind the howls forced the ultimate weapon to fall to his knees as he cried out and shielded his ears from the noise. Then, five more clones materialized and charged ahead, leaping into the air above the other clones and using their blades to channel wind chakra. Before Seimei could fire back, the dragon's heads lunged out and absorbed several wind blades. Seimei yelled, Peacock Whirlwind Formation, and encircled himself in a massive, strong whirlwind that blew the clones away. Seimei taunted as she searched for the changed Uzumaki, saying, Enough games! Why don't you face me yourself, instead of hiding like a coward? Prior to unleashing ten more clones, Zen, Aku uttered the words, says the weakling that needed to steal power just to revive himself. Seimei made the dragons unleash multiple wind blasts that decimated the clones, saying, this power was mine for the taking. It's what you ninja owe after looking down on Takumi village for so long, but now you see just how weak you are against us, great vacuum cannon. A clone charged him from behind and slashed the ultimate weapon across his back before one of the dragons bit down and dispelled it, causing him to grit his teeth. Let's see how you like lightning, next, exclaimed the clone, slapping their sword and blasting Seimei with lightning, making him laugh. Peacock whirlwind, exclaimed Seimei, and the dragons unleashed windstorms that scattered the lightning and obliterated the clone. Yes, 
a village full of weaklings that rely on weapons to make them strong rather than growing and training themselves, using a power that's not truly their own. Perhaps because you all know deep down, just how weak you truly are. Zen. Aku said, further infuriating Seimei. Seimei ordered the dragons to shoot bursts of fire, burning away the trees in an attempt to locate Zen. Aku. Silence. Takumi village has the greatest blacksmiths and artisans in the world. Every one of you ninja were always begging to get weapons made there, Seimei yelled. Yet it wasn't long before the hidden villages started getting better at making their own weapons, leaving your entire village obsolete. None of you have any use, so now you're trying to act big and powerful when you're really nothing but parasites. Desperately trying to get any power you can, no matter where it comes from. You say ninja are weak, but the only reason you're as strong as you were is because of power you took from a ninja. That seems like you know ninja are powerful, otherwise why would you seek to use the power of one? Zen. Aku replied with the ultimate weapon, deep in his chest. As Zen. Aku was being insulted, the other Takumi ninja were equally furious and wanted nothing more than to destroy Zen. Aku. Their belief that Seimei would make the Duke Wolf regret daring to challenge them was the only thing preventing them. Seimei let out a scream of pure rage at Zen. AKU's statement, you're not an ultimate anything, all that you are is a broken tool. As the dragons let out roars and jets of fire, Seimei cried out, I'll kill you, peacock whirlwind formation. He then built a massive hurricane around himself that erupted into a raging inferno the moment the wind touched the flames. The ultimate weapon was determined to burn everything in his path until Zen. Aku showed up or he saw his burned body. Zen. Aku said, yet you can't even tell when someone's behind you. Seimei spun around instantly, but he didn't see anyone behind him and cried out when he was slashed across the back. Seimei was forced to turn around once more in order to see Zen. Aku, who was yelling with rage as his dragons lunged forward to devour him. His rage only increased upon realizing that Zen. Aku was simply another shadow clone. Or underneath you. Zen. Aku uttered as he abruptly rose up from the earth, swinging Zanjetsu and severing Seimei's chest with the fire sword and infinite armor. Seimei cried out in terror, no, as the infinite armor was sliced in half, preventing him from healing his wounds or absorbing chakra. Gaping in agony as Zen. Aku struck his chest with his foot, breaking the remnants of the infinite armor and launching the ultimate weapon into the tree. Zen. Aku pointed Zanjetsu at Seimei and said, thank you for giving me all the information I needed. Now it's time to die. His eyes glowed menacingly. Glaring murderously at the Duke Wolf, Seimei demanded, WH. What information? What did you do? You didn't think those clones were just to fight, did you? They were just to gather information and data on your abilities, or should I say the abilities of your weapons? I originally thought those dragons were what allowed you to absorb chakra, but it was the armor while the dragons just acted as conduits. The same with the fire and wind, you used the dragons to channel the power of the other weapons. But now you can't absorb chakra or generate fire. The revelation only increased Seimei's rage. Having the dragons unleash their first windbursts at Zen, Aku, Seimei exclaimed, I can still cut you into pieces with wind, great vacuum cannon. Zen. Aku channeled Chakra into Zanjetsu and said, like that'll save you. He was momentarily taken aback when it burst into flames even though he had not used fire Chakra. Holding the sword and raising it, Zen. Aku thought, that's interesting, but I'm not complaining. Zen. Aku let out a shout as he swung Zanjetsu, igniting a massive wave of flames that only got stronger as it hit the wind blasts. Seimei spun a whirlwind around himself and shot upward to escape the flames, his eyes widening with fear. As Zen, Aku materialized behind Seimei and swung Zanjetsu, severing the soaring short's words into fragments, he exclaimed, didn't I say you couldn't run? No, exclaimed Seimei as he crashed into the ground, causing the whirlwind to disappear, and Zen. Aku saw that Zanjetsu was soon encircled by a swirling gust of wind. Soon, a whirlwind engulfed him, holding Zen, Aku aloft. Since I destroyed that armor, Zanjetsu should also be able to absorb chakra. It appears that he can absorb and assimilate the powers of his weapons. Perfect, thought Zen. Aku, before lowering his gaze to Seimei. Zen. Aku exclaimed, great vacuum cannon, as he swung Zanjetsu and blasted Seimei with a barrage of wind blasts, 
causing the ultimate weapon to scream as they collided with him. Zen. Aku yelled, peacock formation, as he started to spin Zanjetsu in all directions, launching a tornado at Seimei. He cried out as the whirlwind struck him and threw Seimei skyward, leaving him with no time to move aside. To Seimei's increasingly increasing horror, Zen. Aku exclaimed, now for the last one, as he firmly grasped Zanjetsu before charging forward at him. With a shout, the Duke Wolf swung Zanjetsu, and Seimei desperately commanded the dragons to lunge toward Zen. Aku in the hopes that they would seize and devour him. Only to scream horrified when Zanjetsu was held above Zen. Aku's head as he flew up over the dragons. Zen. Aku yelled, off with your heads, as he defeated Zanjetsu, severed the dragon's heads, and broke the Garion sword. Seimei cried out in terror, n.no.no, no, as he dropped his final weapon and fell to the ground. After landing, Zen. Aku watched the wind surrounding Zanjetsu blow away and the sword's black part turn blue, taking on the appearance of dragon scales. Seeing the segments also helped to give Zen. Aku an understanding of what it accomplished. When Zen. Aku channeled chakra into Zanjetsu and swung the sword at Seimei, the sword extended out and became engulfed in chakra, quickly taking the form of a dragon. Now then, you have something that belongs to me. Zen. Aku exclaimed. The ultimate weapon screamed in pain as the dragon roared as it shot forward, encircling Seimei and biting down on his abdomen. His cries became more intense as he sensed the dragon starting to take his chakra and return it to Zen, Aku. As he reclaimed the last of Seimei's power, Zen, Aku exclaimed, You thought you were some ultimate being by stealing power. Let's show you what you really are. The Duke Wolf then swung Zanjetsu up, lifting Seimei into the air and slamming him into the ground causing the ultimate weapon to gag and cough up blood. The dragon quickly withdrew as Zanjetsu resumed normalcy, exposing Seimei's mummified and now crippled body. Seimei. Sama. Exclaimed a terrified Takumi ninja upon seeing their leader, while others hurried to assist him. Zen. Aku yelled, rotating ferocious wind, as he swung Zanjetsu at the Takumi ninja, unleashing a fierce gust of wind that knocked them and the other Takumi ninja members back. Gazing back at Seimei, Zen. Aku saw how his strength had been completely drained from him, causing him to sigh and cough in agony. Causing the Duke Wolf to snarl softly and then raising Zanjetsu while directing a lot of chakra into it. With it first gathering near the blade and then transferring to the tip. Zen. Aku grabbed Zanjetsu with both hands and exclaimed, You wanted this power, so badly? Let it be the last thing you ever see. Getsuga Tensho. Zen. Aku cried out as he defeated Zanjetsu and slashed a great, crescent, shaped slash of black and red chakra directly at Seimei, much to his horror and fear. The ultimate weapon attempted to move aside, but as the blast engulfed him, he let out a brief cry of excruciating pain. His body vaporized in an instant, leaving nothing but a path carved out of pure destruction. His screams ended as soon as that happened. The death of their leader greatly shocked and devastated the Takumi ninja. Kujiku cried out, Seimei, Sama, and collapsed to her knees in desperation. Ryugan muttered, falling to his hands and knees, H, he, 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 he's, dead, our weapons, gone, they had lost both their leader and their weapons. To their increasing horror, the Takumi ninja saw Zen, Aku turn and face them, his eyes glowing evilly as he pointed Zanjetsu in their direction. Zen, Aku said, don't worry. You all will be joining him in a moment. This made the Takumi ninja start to crawl away from the Duke Wolf. Please, 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 we'll do anything you want, cried out a ninja, desperate to avoid being slain by this monster. We'll give you our weapons, all of them, cried a third, offering Zen. Aku anything in exchange for his sparing them. Another ninja added, we'll make any weapon you want, just name it and we'll make it for you in the hopes that the Duke Wolf would back down after he promised to obtain any weapon he wanted. Kujiku, looking horrified as Zen. Aku continued to approach, pleaded, you can even have us as your slaves, all of Takumi village will serve you, just please, mercy. Getsuga Tensho. There's your mercy. Dying quickly. Exclaimed Zen. Aku, swinging Zanjetsu once more and unleashing a wave of chakra toward the Takumi ninja. Only Ryugan let out a cry as the attack struck him, 
as the other ninja were instantly destroyed by the blast and had no time to scream. With the hope that the Duke Wolf would be sidetracked by the others and allow him to save himself, the Bluenet has been stealthily making her way away. Only to feel his right leg and arm snapped from the blow and impact, the Getsuga Tensho sent him crashing into the earth, whimpering in terror. Prior to that, Ryugan saw the Duke Wolf coming towards Zen. Aku and turned to look at him in utter terror. Zen. Aku looked at Ryugan, disgusted that he would actually try to desert his own comrades, and said, you're even worse than the rest of those parasites. Trying to save your own pathetic life rather than die with your allies. pl.p.p.p.l.p.l.p.l.p.l.p.l. p.ple. Please, Ryugan stammered, writhing helplessly backward in fear of what Zen, Aku would do to him. Sadly, Ryugan didn't make it very far before he felt himself bump into something, which caused him to whimper in terror that he was stuck. He looked up, only to have his eyes enlarge upon realizing that he had actually bumped into someone. His panic peaked when he noticed Satsuki holding one of the chakra saber hilts over him and glaring down at him with her sharingan. Ryugan screamed, Wa! 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 W! Wait! But was cut down when Satsuki pulled the saber, sending the red blade piercing Ryugan's head. Satsuki said, deactivating the chakra saber and placing it in her pouch with the second one told you I'd kill you. The Uchiha turned to face the Duke Wolf after giving Zen. Aku a sympathetic look and deactivating her Sharingan. So, this is what that mask did to you, Satsuki said, tilting his head and giving Zen. Aku a sidelong glance. Zen. Aku answered, yeah, it turned me into something not entirely human and lets me transform into Zen. Aku, the Duke Wolf. Satsuki just nodded in agreement. Before Satsuki abruptly lunged forward and gave Zen. Aku a tight hug, he startled him. Do you have any idea how scared I was? First we had to deal with going to the fire temple after it was attacked, seeing everyone there dead, then learning you were captured and being used to revive that bastard, Seimei. That they were taking your chakra, that you could have died? I, said Satsuki, burying her face in his chest, shuddering at everything that's happened. After witnessing the carnage at the fire temple and discovering that Naruto had been taken hostage by the Takumi ninja, she was hardly able to act before her Sharingan awoke. Now that it was over and she could see her friend, Crush was safe, it only made her feel better. Zen. Aku apologized profusely to Satsuki, but assured her that everything was well, putting the fire temple story away for later. Satsuki cut off the Duke Wolf, saying, no, it's not alright. Satsuki breathing heavily as she finally admitted her feelings, said, our first mission outside the village nearly got you killed, then you go out to get a weapon and are nearly killed again. That is the farthest thing from being alright. I'm not even going to be surprised if something like this happens again, and I'm not going to wait for it before telling you I love you. Zen. Aku stared at her in shock. Zen. Aku questioned, not believing what he had just heard, you. What? I said I love you okay, I have for years, ever since you were too stubborn to abandon me after that night. Even after everything I said to try and make you leave so you wouldn't get hurt, you still stayed around, never leaving me alone. Making me still feel like there was still some light in my life rather than just darkness and revenge. You were my first friend and stayed with me through everything, but Kami there are times when you make me want to bang my head against a wall, but there were also times where I'm thankful to have you in my life, I comma I love you, Naruto Uzumaki. No matter what you are or whatever stupid things you do that drive me crazy, I love you, always. Satsuki said while getting it all off her chest, placing her hand on Zen. AKU's face, while the Duke Wolf looked at her in disbelief. I think I can say I love you too, Satsuki Uchiha, Zen. Aku said, holding her hand. It makes me happy, pushes me to be stronger so that nothing happens to you, to keep you safe. So I think I can say I love you too. Satsuki Uchiha, she said, not even remembering the last time she smiled this brightly or felt this happy. You were my first friend and my best friend, and you became someone I cared about more than anything else. I didn't care about anything you said back then, because I wasn't going to lose the first friend I ever had, no matter how much you tried to push me away. You really don't know how thrilled I am to hear that, Satsuki said, glancing back and forth. Satsuki said, for the record, I think you honestly look pretty attractive like this still. The Duke Wolf was taken by surprise and did not anticipate it. 
Zen. Aku asked, half. Joking, half. Seriously, seriously? Is that you admitting you're secretly a furry? The ravenette's smile changed to one of amusement? Satsuki said, half. Joking and half. Seriously, depends. Can you also turn into a kimono mimi? Cause I don't think I'll be able to control myself, then. Zen. Aku turned back into Naruto and said, and you call me weird and crazy. Satsuki then put her arms around his neck. Satsuki pressed her lips to the whiskered ravenettes and said, I suppose I prefer you in this form, if only because it lets me do this. As Naruto joyfully planted his hands on Satsuki's hips and drew her in, they both felt the world around them dissolve and become only aware of one another. Preventing them from seeing the other members of the recovery team groan as they started to awaken and stare in shock and dismay at the devastation all around them. Asuma said, uh. What? What happened? As he and the others slowly stood up, Guy needed support from Kakashi and Yamato because of the injuries he sustained from the eight gates and Seimei's blows to his body. Kakashi looked around, then saw his students still in their own world. I think that Naruto must have defeated Seimei and the rest of the Takumi ninja. And got the girl too, apparently. Guy grinned and exclaimed, Ha ha ha. Your students' flames of youth are truly burning brightly, Kakashi. But then groaned in agony as he felt his muscles torn and some of his bones fractured. Naruto and Satsuki were startled into reality by the sudden shout and blushed when they realized the rest of the team was awake and they were making out in front of them. Anko looked at Ryugan's body, the only one left, and said, Haha, good for you brats, great job taking out those assholes. Girly brat, did you kill that short loudmouth asshole? Satsuki gave the purplette a smile and answered, You. Uh. 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 Yeah, I stabbed him through the head. Much to their embarrassment, Anko said, Good, someone needed to shut him up, and by all means, carry on, I could use a good show. Yamato asked, not seeing any bodies other than Ryugans, before you do that, Naruto, could you tell us what happened to Seimei and the other Takumi ninja? The retrieval team was taken aback when Naruto said, There aren't exactly any bodies left, but I'm sure the ashes are still lying around. I think. He was pointing to the location where the Takumi ninja had once been. It appears that you'll finally need those guides I offered earlier, Kakashi said with a smile, the Uzumaki staring at him sourly. I see. Then well done Naruto, you were able to stop Seimei and his allies. Naruto made the copy ninja appear as though he had been struck again, saying, I seem to be doing fine without them, but by all means get another for yourself Kakashi. Sensei, you probably need all the help you can get. Hanada grinned at her teammates and said, See. Congratulations Naruto.kun, Satsuki. Chan. Th. Though if you're together now. When we get back to the village, do you promise not to be too loud? I wouldn't want to be woken up. Kurenai, Naruto, and Satsuki looked at her in shock that Hinata had actually said something along those lines. Hinata whispered to Satsuki, or you can be loud as you want, as long as you give me the details afterwards. The Ravenette blushed more and became more shocked not sure if the Hyuga was kidding or not. Prior to removing Hinata to the side, Kurenai worriedly observed the blue net and asked if she was okay. Kurenai asked Hinata, Hinata, are you really alright? Since I know how you, I just want to make sure that it's not you. Kurenai was aware of her crush on Naruto and wanted to make sure she was okay since he was with Satsuki, her best friend and teammate. Hinata said, Blushing at the thought of telling someone she intended to share Naruto with Satsuki and probably other girls, I'm fine, really Kurenai. Sensei. As long as Naruto.kun is with someone he loves and loves him, then I'm happy for him. A dot and besides. Um. Satsuki. Chan and I, kind of, agreed to share Naruto.kun already. The Genjutsu mistress, unable to believe what she had just heard, gave her a wide, startled look. That Satsuki and Hanada intended to share Naruto. It's good that you'll both be happy then, Kurenai said, still in shock that the once dot shy Hanada would be sharing her favorite guy. Okay, let's talk about Naruto and Satsuki's relationship later, for now, we still have a mission to complete, Kakashi exclaimed, grabbing everyone's attention and making them take their mission seriously. With their role completed and the Anbu set to take over Takumi village permanently, Asuma asked, right. The four celestial symbols men and Seimei are dead. What's next? We are going to meet up with Totose to pick up Yugo. 
I have already sent my Ninkan ahead to let them know where to meet and to notify the Anbu so they can start moving in to exterminate Takumi village and secure their secrets. Kakashi said, aware that the Anbu should have arrived at Takumi village by now, ready to start eradicating any threat that might still exist. Well done, Naruto exclaimed, relieved that Takumi village was being destroyed in light of everything that had transpired. With everyone nodding in agreement, Yamato said, once we meet up and retrieve Yugo, it'll be time to head back to the village. They then got ready to go meet Totose and Yugo. Though Hanada paused briefly upon noticing one of the few weapons the Takumi ninja had left undamaged. Glancing it over in amazement before reaching over and grabbing it. With the appearance of a trident combined with a bishaman, Yari and a crystalline, looking G, similar to a G, it has a horsehair tassel, but instead of the customary red color, it is blue. Additionally, the two side blades are straight and have concave edges, unlike the bishaman. Yari's typical crescent blades. It ends in a drill, like or corkscrew shape. Channeling chakra to it, Hanada spun it around, remembering seeing some of the Takumi ninja use tridents. She smiled as water flowed freely from both ends. When a test swing was given, a wave of water shot out and struck a tree, stunning the blue net as the tree fell to the ground. Naruto said, looking at Hanada with Satsuki, I take it you're keeping that? The Hayuga grinned and nodded. Knowing how helpful it will be to learn water-style ninjutsu in addition to her lightning-style ninjutsu, Hanada said, yeah, I think I'm going to keep it. In addition, Satsuki now claimed her new chakra sabers, and Naruto now possessed Zanjetsu, which made the blue net desire a personal weapon. Satsuki questioned, are you going to give it a name? As they approached the Janin and Hanada fastened the trident to her back. As the team headed to retrieve Yugo next, Hanada said, I think. Nejibana is a good name, getting nods from her friends and teammates. Standing on a cliff with a view of Takumi village were Yugo, Totose, and a few other blacksmiths and locals. They were all watching as the deployed Enbu mercilessly killed every last one of the survivors. Regardless of their identities, blacksmiths, Takumi ninja, or average citizens, all of them perished. The Anbu were gathering any secrets they could find in the areas that had already been cleared out. For even Yugo, who knew Anbu carried out such assignments and had to participate in a few purges as well, witnessing so much death was a very depressing sight. Cursing silently that it has come to this, along with the four celestial symbols men and their allies. Prior to examining Totose and the other blacksmiths who departed from the village, a village that had accepted them, if reluctantly, being completely destroyed. Totose shook his head and sighed as Yugo said, for what it's worth, I'm sorry it had to come to this and it's cost all of you your home. It's not your fault, on some level we all knew a day like this may come. Everyone in Takumi village never kept it a secret how much they hated ninja and the hidden villages, never trusting anyone not from Takumi. They certainly never trusted us. Totose said, the other blacksmiths nodding in agreement. Prior to retiring and settling down, each of them had come from a ninja family and pursued careers in the manufacturing of weapons instead of using them. They all knew that even though they were allowed to remain in Takumi village, they were never made to feel welcome. Along with those who, although not holding the same anti-ninja beliefs as the majority of the population, had spent their entire lives in Takumi. Regardless of who was purchasing or not, their only concern was their work and selling their creations. They all understood that, given the way they were all treated, whether as a result of their own ideologies or upbringing, something similar had to happen eventually. Seeing as how Takumi village was being destroyed was finally happening, they weren't too upset about it. Where will you all go, now? Yugo asked, inquiring as to their plans for the moment that Takumi was no longer with them. Looking back, Todose said, I'm sure we'll find somewhere more welcoming to stay, maybe in the elemental nations, maybe outside of them, maybe in different places. Who can say, but we'll survive. You though, I'm sure will be returning to your village now. The retrieval team immediately arrived, much to the purplet's relief. Kakashi said, Yugo, it's good to see you're all right. Yugo nodded in agreement. Yugo grinned at the whiskered ravenette and said, as much as I can be with what happened Senpei, but if not for Todasai's assistance I doubt I would be. Though what I am glad about is seeing you're all right Naruto. Yeah. Though. I'm sorry I couldn't do more when we were ambushed Yugo. Sensei, Naruto uttered, feeling defeated and appalled at his own capture, only to have the Anbu shake her head in response. Don't be alarmed. 
Neither the weapons nor the plan of the celestial symbols men could have predicted our attack. If anything, I should apologize. I knew the Takumi village people's perception of ninja, but I didn't consider the possibility that they were planning something. I should have suspected it and been prepared, Yugo said, putting the blame on herself for not anticipating this kind of situation when they arrived in Takumi village. Well if it's any conciliation, everything turned out fine. We've dealt with the four celestial symbols men, their allies and Seimei, and none of them will be causing trouble ever again. Yamato stated, surprising and worrying Yugo. Yugo, worried but relieved that even though Seimei was revived, he was killed again, asked, Seimei was revived? Anko said, causing the Anbu to look at Naruto startled before realizing that Zanjetsu had changed. Yep. The bastard was a lot stronger than we were expecting, but it looks like the brat's fancy new sword was enough to put him back in the ground. Is that it? Yugo exclaimed, startled to see Zanjetsu no longer resemble the katana but rather the drawing from Naruto. Naruto said, Zanjetsu, yeah. I was able to awaken its real power. He then reached for his sword just as Totose approached him. Totose said, so it seems, yet don't let that stop you from finding out what else it can do. Just because Zanjetsu is now awakened, doesn't mean it's as powerful as it can be. Though how powerful it is, that'll be for you to discover. Naruto nodded at his clansmen, eager to see what she could accomplish with Zanjetsu. Okay guys, we're officially done with our mission and can now head back to the village. Totose, thank you so much for saving Yugo. Without her message, we might have reached Seimei and the Celestial Symbols men too late. Kakashi nodded to the elderly Uzumaki, to which Totose replied. Totose said, looking at the younger Uzumaki with curiosity. Of course, I'm glad I could help. But before you go, I have one last piece of advice for you, Naruto. Both for your training as a blacksmith and for Zanjetsu. Naruto inquired, what is it, as if there was anything more he needed to know. Patience. That is the most important lesson any blacksmith can learn, you must have patience. The greatest weapons are those that could take weeks and even months to create. It can't be rushed or forced. You must let yourself be guided in what you create. Accepting it won't be finished in an instant, otherwise all you'll be left with is a piece of junk. The same applies to that sword of yours, you might have awakened its power now, but it will still take time before you have truly mastered it. It will take time and patience, but I believe you'll succeed in seeing the true power of your creation." Totose said, with Naruto thinking over his words before nodding. Shivering, Naruto said, I understand, and I'll make sure to take care of Zanjetsu. Totose gave him a menacing look with his beady eyes. Totose held up a pair of pliers and said, good, because if you didn't, I will know, then I will find you and have to fix it myself. And that'll mean I'd need new materials. The reminder caused Yugo and Naruto to shiver. With no intention of having any of his teeth extracted, Naruto replied, why? Yeah, I'll make sure you don't need to do that. With the retrieval team watching, Todose waved to Naruto as he and the other blacksmiths departed, saying, see that you don't. So, farewell and perhaps we'll cross paths again sometime. The Konoha ninja, eager to return home and rest after their mission, took their leave and started back toward Konoha as soon as they were all out of sight. Village Takumi. Concurrently, the Anbu were eliminating the final inhabitants of Takumi village and obtaining their confidential information. When Seimei's body was first kept in storage before being moved, an Anbu searching for secrets found one in his empty mausoleum. Discovering a scroll that held the jutsu necessary to bring Seimei back to life. The Anbu quickly glanced around to make sure they were alone, then removed their glove to reveal a tattoo of a snake around their arm. The Anbu cut their arm just enough to get some blood, then wiped it off the tattoo with their hand while still on the ground. A snake materialized in a cloud of smoke, and the Anbu uttered the words, summoning Jutsu. The snake lunged forward, swallowing the scroll, and vanished in a puff of smoke when the Anbu said, take this to Orochimaru. Sama immediately, I'm sure he'll be pleased to receive it. Knowing that their true master had obtained the most crucial item, the Anbu swiftly left the mausoleum to carry out the extermination pulling their glove back up over the summoning tattoo. Otogakure. With a grunt, Sora's eyes opened and he scowled at a light that was shining down on him. He then swung his right arm at the light to knock it away. Only to be shocked when, with a sudden disintegration, he slashed straight through the light, reddish. Orange cracks spreading along it. Kabuto's dry expression made Sora sit up and narrow his eyes at the medical. Nin. 
Well, I guess that means you at least have Kimimaro's new toxic blood. But I'd ask you try to avoid doing that again. Kabuto mentioned. After getting out of bed, Sora said, so the operation worked then. He then pointed to his right arm, which had received the infusion of the Kiyubi's chakra, and noted its current condition. Yeah, it's actually pretty interesting. With Jugo's ability to change and mutate his body through his Keke Jenke, it makes sense that his DNA would meld so well with the Biju chakra in your right arm. And given the condition of your arm, it appears Jugo can prove compatible with Jinchuriki, especially a pseudo one like yourself. I'm sure you'll also find it much less painful in using the Kiyubi's chakra in your arm. Sora grinned slyly as he caused his arm to turn a deeper shade of crimson and extended into claws that glowed orange. As for Kimimaro's DNA, it's unlikely you'll ever awaken the Shikatsumyaku as even with his DNA, the difference in your biology from his makes it impossible for you to use your bones as weapons, let alone regrow them at the rate Kimimaro can. However, you'll still find your body is far stronger and more durable, which will also make it easier to use the Kiyubi's chakra without it destroying your body. And as I said, it looks like you gained his new toxic blood and from the looks of it, it seems to be concentrated in your hand with the Kiyubi's chakra, rather than flowing through you. Interesting. Kabuto muttered, watching Sora's hand in intrigue as it glowed. With excitement, Sora exclaimed, so, it can melt anything it touches then. He thought of applying it to Asuma and all the people he loves about and watching them all melt away. Before dumping a stack of clothes on the bed to attract Sora's attention, Kabuto answered, yes, at least from what we've seen from the previous tests with Kimimaro. Whether there's something that could stand up to it remains to be seen. Knowing he had to return to Konoha before his clone was discovered, Kabuto said, here, some fresh clothes. Orochimaru. Sama has also put some failed test subjects in the arena for you to test your new abilities and get used to them. With a sly smile, Sora tore apart the monk robes, the only item he still owned from the fire temple, and watched as they crumbled to make way for his new attire. He's now got on a black kimono top, black pants tucked into black ninja sandals, a grey turtleneck, and a black kimono sandal with the longer sleeve on the right to cover his arm. In addition, he pocketed his tekaji. Shuko, preferring to try out his new skills before employing his weapon or wind style ninjutsu. After putting on his clothes, Sora left the room and made his way to the arena, his sly grin growing icier as he saw the botched, altered experiments beneath him. The former monk stabbed them in the back with his right hand before jumping down on top of one. As glowing orange cracks appeared all over their bodies, his smirk grew. The experiment gave birth to flames after writhing and screaming in agony. The other experiments were shocked by what they saw and turned to face Sora in terror as he turned to face them his eyes flashing red and then yellow as he raised his glowing hand. As he walked up to the experiments, Sora flexed his hand and extended his claws, saying, be careful, I'm toxic. After. Satisfied with his newfound ability, Sora glanced around at the smoldering, crumbling remnants of the experiments. The blue net looked up to see his father beaming at him before he heard someone clapping. Kazuma, happy with his son's growth, said, good job Sora. You've certainly grown much stronger with the new abilities you've gained. And with my training, you'll truly be a force to be reckoned with, one that no one will be able to stop. Kazuma laughed as Sora, excited to train under his father, asked, When will I be able to start? Kazuma answered, irking Sora a little, Slow down there, we'll have plenty of time to begin, later. Right now, Orochimaru wants to see us. Sora nodded in response as he and his father left the arena. The snake Sanin was seated on the throne in front of the two as they made their way through the base to Orochimaru's throne room. Orochimaru grinned and said, Ah, Sora. I take it you're enjoying your new powers. Sora flexed his right hand and nodded in reply. With satisfaction in his future actions using this power, Sora said, More than I could have hoped for. Thank you. Orochimaru, wanting to make sure Sora actually knew how to use his power, said, I'm happy to hear that. But of course, Strength without training is useless, it must be tempered and refined otherwise, regardless of what you can do, you'll be helpless against more skilled opponents. Otherwise, Sora would just be a rabid animal to be released when he was useful. Orochimaru's smile widened as Kazuma continued, I'll make sure Sora is fully trained and prepared when the time comes. Orochimaru answered, I'm sure you will, Kazuma, but I will be taking over Sora's training. Kazuma scowled at this news. Not wanting the snake Sanin to be in charge of Sora's training, Kazuma said, 
That won't be necessary, I'm perfectly capable of handling my son's training, as I'm sure you'll be busy organizing the invasion. My followers are more than able of handling the preparations while I handle Sora's training, after all, since he now has Jugo's and Kimimaro's DNA, it would be better if he was trained by someone familiar with their abilities. Especially since if Sora gains his own sage transformation like Jugo, he might go berserk and try killing anyone he gets his hands on. It'd be a shame if that were to happen while you're training him, Kazuma. Orochimaru said, and Kazuma grinned at logic. Even though it would make sense, Kazuma understood it to be a threat and a warning that he is powerless to object and that doing so would result in a unfortunate accident. He also knew that the snake Sanin intended to prevent him from trying to use Sora against him. Kazuma hesitantly said, Okay, I hope you'll help Sora master his new abilities. Orochimaru just grinned in satisfaction. Just before he noticed it, a messenger snake materialized on his throne's armrest, opening its mouth and swallowing a scroll. Taking it and brushing the snake aside, Orochimaru unfolded the scroll and examined it curiously, arousing Kazuma and Sora's curiosity about what might be inside. After catching a glimpse of what was inside the scroll and realizing it was some sort of jutsu, Sora questioned, what is that? Before Orochimaru swiftly shut it and pocketed it. Orochimaru stood up and left the throne room, telling Sora to shrug and follow the Sanin. Nothing you need to worry about. The only thing you'll need to focus on is your training, which we'll be starting now. Though he was careful to keep in mind the jutsu in the scroll he saw because you never know when you might need it. Konoha, alongside Hanabi. Gritting her teeth, Hanabi unleashed a barrage of palm strikes on a training dummy, hitting every known location for a tenketsu. Hanabi became even more irritated as she continued to strike the dummy, saying, Very good, Hanabi. Sama. But don't forget, the most important part of the eight trigrams is ensuring to get in close and stun an opponent first. Leaving them open and vulnerable for your following Jukan strikes. Of course, I already know that, please tell me something that will be helpful. Hanabi struck the dummy in the center after giving it some thought. Three more dummies materialized behind Hanabi, and the instructor warned, you must also be sure to stay aware of the position of any other enemies you are fighting. If you focus too much on just one, you may find yourself attacked from behind. The brunette then leapt over the dummies and started hitting them, her blows powerful enough to topple them. The instructor said, lastly, you must, but Hanabi interrupted with a shout, charging the final dummy and striking him squarely in the chest with a palm strike. Causing the dummy's chest to erupt, while Hanabi gave her instructor a fierce look while gasping for air. Hanabi said, make sure my enemies don't get back up, even if I hit their tenketsu. I know. Her teacher nodded in agreement. The brunette was already leaving the training area and returning when the instructor said, yes, Hanabi. Sama. You're progressing really well in your lessons, I'm sure you'll be working on the advanced techniques in no time. But for now, training is done for the day. Hanabi went to her room, slammed the door, and threw herself onto her bed, clenching her fists as her thoughts, which she did not want to revisit, returned to her match against Kanoka and her confrontation with Hinata. She's been attempting to ignore it, but despite her best efforts, she couldn't help but think about it, with training serving as the only break. She ended up training even harder as a result to divert her attention. Even worse, she still harbors the hope that confronting Hinata and winning over her, replacement, will finally make her feel better than she has been feeling. But Hanabi felt even worse than she had before she left, as the rush of victory wore off. She feels as though she is gradually disintegrating, the emptiness that has been inside of her ever since Hinata, replaced, her only growing larger. Why, why, why? What makes them so unique, particularly that loser Kanoka, I'm better than they ever could be. I defeated her, demonstrating my strength, how come she gives a damn about her? Hanabi let out a mental scream and hurriedly got out of bed, wanting to get some fresh air instead of being cooped up in her room. As Hanabi made her way to the estate's exit, she failed to pay attention to her surroundings and ran into someone. Someone asked, are you alright, Hanabi? Sama? Which caused Hanabi to look up and see Natsu Hayuga, her caregiver. Like the rest of her clan, Natsu is a young woman with large white eyes and short, dark green hair. She had on a full, length black kimono, black ninja sandals, a white apron over it, and a Konoha forehead protector wrapped around her forehead. Hanabi whispered, I'm fine, and brushed past the greenette, only to have Natsu take a gentle hold of her arm. Natsu said worriedly, Hanabi. Sama, 
If something is bothering you then you can always. Her eyes widened as Hanabi slapped her hand away. With a narrowed gaze, Hanabi shot back at her caregiver, I said I'm fine. Natsu watched in dismay as Hanabi fled. Concerned about Hanabi's recent actions and how they have changed since that boy took Hanada away, Natsu thought, Hanabi, Sama. I find him unbelievable. Natsu, hating how the Jinchuriki's actions are now affecting Hanabi, not even wanting to imagine how he's corrupting Hanada, thought of how she could help the two girls. It was bad enough that Hanada. Sama had some strange fascination for that boy, but now he's taken her away from her own family and clan. Ko Hayuga, Hanada's former caretaker, was nearby and had witnessed the altercation between them, but the Greenette was blind to it. Ko shares the same features as Hayuga, including featureless white eyes, short brown hair with backward spikes, and fair skin. While on duty, he typically wore the standard Konoha uniform and wore his headband as a bandana, but he wasn't wearing the typical black kimono that all Hayuga wear. Ko, who had been passing by when he saw Hanabi bump into Natsu and heard what was said before the young heiress stormed off, scowled as he watched Hanabi go. He was also mentally cursing Naruto, accusing him of stealing Hanada and now of Hanabi's actions. I should have done more to keep that boy away from Hanada. Sama, but now that she's gone, she's in his hands, before the Kiyubi Jinchuriki sank his teeth even further into Hanada, Ko wished there was something he could do to save her. In partnership with Hanabi, soon after leaving the Hayuga estate, Hanabi started to stroll through Konoha, feeling relieved to be outside and away from everyone. Wanting only to walk and distract herself, with no specific destination in mind. Sadly, Hanabi had to stop when she heard several footsteps falling and someone laughing. H-A-H-A-H-A-H-A-H-A-H-A-H-A, you losers will never catch me. Hanabi heard the voice, paused at its recognition, then looked in the direction of the voice, narrowing her eyes at Kanoka. The Hokage's granddaughter was running from a group of academy instructors that Aruka was leading when she grinned. However, the fact that they were all covered in glittering blue, feathers, and white powder is what attracted people's attention. They also had multiple mousetraps fastened to their bodies. Aruka yelled, Kanoka, just wait until I get my hands on you, you'll be detention for the next year. The brunette just smiled and pulled out a bag in response. Kanoka said, if you can catch me, that is, have fun, Aruka. Sensei. And then she threw the bag behind her, letting dozens of marbles fall out. Causing the teachers to fall and roll around. A few of them attempted to jump over the marbles, but Kanoka attacked them with smoke bombs. But as the chunin started rolling the ground and screaming, they released clouds of red powder smoke instead of typical smoke clouds. Oh Kami it burns. Where did she get powdered peppers? My eyes. When Kanoka saw Aruka standing in front of her, she stopped abruptly, merely laughing at the sight of the instructors rolling around on the ground. Before Kanoka could flee once more, Aruka yelled, No more games, Kanoka. You're coming with. Ah, and rushed forward to seize the brunette. The Chunin fell into a pit, which was revealed when the ground suddenly cracked open in front of her Kanoka, causing her to scream in shock. Aruka screamed in frustration as he fell into a pool of molasses instead of hitting the bottom of the pit, and Kanoka smiled down at him. Kanoka continued her escape by saying, Aniki told me how you always caught him, so I made sure to be prepared. Good luck getting out of that, Sensei. Kanoka, looking surprised to see Aruka giving her an irritated glare, yelled as she was abruptly grabbed and lifted into the air, just before she could flee. How did you? Kanoka asked, then noticed a log where Aruka had been when she peered into the pit. Aruka turned to drag Kanoka back to the academy, grunting as he had to push his body to move because he was still covered in molasses, making it difficult. And I've dealt with enough of Naruto's pranks to know how he thinks, that includes you now too. Now let's go, he exclaimed. As Hanabi watched Kanoka being hauled off, she gritted her teeth and couldn't help but think of their match once more. How, despite defeating Kanoka twice, she was still able to win against her once. That Kanoka was able to cause her problems and win even though she won the overmatch. Hanabi's eyes narrowed when the other brunette was led off. Afterwards, with Kanoka squad Kanoka spent the remainder of the day in detention after being hauled back to the academy and having to clean up the mess her antics had caused. The brunette saw Moegi and Udon waiting for her when she finished and hurried out of the academy. Udon said, fearing that if Kanoka continued to play practical jokes, she would soon find herself in serious trouble. Kanoka, 
that's the sixth time you've gotten in trouble for pranks in just this week. Maybe you should hold off on pulling anymore, so you don't get in trouble. Moegi grinned sarcastically as Kanoka remarked, you worry too much Udon, nothing bad has happened and nothing will. Besides, it's not like anyone's getting hurt, I'm just helping the teachers learn to loosen up. Moegi inquired, wanting to know how Udon led Uruka. Sensei to the correct location of the hole. Yeah, there's nothing to worry about, Udon. In addition, I think it's actually pretty funny, Moegi said. Kanoka, excited to tell Naruto about her most recent antics, exclaimed, Aniki always said to have an escape route planned out, and have a way to either hide or stall those chasing you long enough to get away. I can't wait to tell him about the pranks I've pulled. Moegi's smile turned into a slight frown before she smirked. Well you'll have to wait, because when Ni. Chan gets back I'm going to show him how much I've improved my training since he, Hanada. Ni Chan and Satsuki. Ni Chan started helping us. I'm sure he'll be impressed with how far I've gotten with the surface walking exercise. Moegi stated, causing Kanoka to scowl. I've gotten really far with it too, and it'll be even better when I tell him, since I needed to work harder to get good at surface walking, said Kanoka with a grin. Moegi smirked at the brunette and said, I've also been learning more about water style and earth style ninjutsu, since I want Ni. Chan to help me get started on learning to use them. Moegi was hoping to enlist Naruto's assistance in developing her affinities. Udon sighed as he considered how Kanoka and Moegi were competing to see who could impress Naruto more. I'll never understand girls. Kanoka proudly crossed her arms and said, I'm still ahead with the jutsu Satsuki. Nichan helped me learn. Besides, I also made my own jutsu from one of Aniki's. Moegi and Udon stared at her in shock. Udon was shocked to learn that Kanoka had made her own jutsu and asked, You made your own jutsu? Curious to see another of Naruto's jutsu, Moegi asked, It's a jutsu ni, Chan knows, what is it? Kanoka stated, It's not the exact same one Aniki used, but I saw him use it to take down Ebisu. Though this one is just a smaller version of it. This excited Moegi and Udon to learn that a jutsu this powerful existed. Moegi exclaimed, Well come on, show us, Kanoka stood back and gestured. As Kanoka was engulfed in a cloud of smoke, she exclaimed, Sexy jutsu. Moegi and Udon were momentarily perplexed by the name. Just as the smoke started to clear, Udon blushed brightly and some blood leaked out of his nose, causing their eyes to widen in shock. Revealing Kanoka had changed into a stunning, adolescent version of herself, with her hair now reaching her thighs and her body fully nude. The only thing on her was a jacket that hung off her shoulders, barely covering her enormous breasts, and a few wisps of smoke that covered her ass and crotch. Hi, Kanoka purred sensually, making Udon blush more before he fell back and making Moegi blush as well, mainly out of embarrassment. What kind of jutsu is that? Moegi exclaimed, looking embarrassed and a little envious of how Kanoka would probably turn out when he grew up and the Serutobi returned to normal. With a slight twitch of Moegi's eye, Kanoka exclaimed, that's my sexy jutsu. I saw Aniki use it with shadow clones to do one called the harem jutsu. It took out Ebisu, before Aniki finished him off, I wanted to use it myself, so I worked hard to get the look just right to be really sexy and curvy, as Udon slowly got to his feet. It seems, effective, Udon muttered, blushing a little. Kanoka exclaimed as she was once more engulfed in a cloud of smoke, yeah, but it doesn't seem to work on other girls, so I made one to use on them too. Watch this, reverse sexy jutsu. Moegi said, just because the other one works on guys, doesn't mean you can make one that works on girls, it wouldn't be easy to. 2. As the smoke started to clear and she blushed brightly at the sight, turning away from Udon. When the smoke cleared, a muscular, nude man with short hair and spiky brown beard was visible. A cloud of smoke covered his crotch. He, winked and grinned, saying, yo, Moegi froze in place her whole face going red as blood spurted from her nose. Before a cloud of smoke engulfed the man, Kanoka laughed at Moegi's expression. Kanoka exclaimed, what was that about it not working, Moegi? As the Orangette hastily wiped her nose and shook her head. Moegi, still blushing a little, exclaimed, th th. That proves nothing, but her blush quickly returned when she imagined Kanoka changing into a certain black, haired guy with whiskers. Udon inquired, wondering how Kanoka was able to create a reverse sexy jutsu. You. Uh. Kanoka. 
You said that first one you made based on Naruto's jutsu, but? How exactly did you make that other one? Udon said. Kanoka said, blushing slightly as she recalled the adult magazines and novels she had read, as well as the pictures she had seen. That was easy. I modeled it after Uncle Asuma and Grandpa, after finding some pictures of him when he was younger. Kanoka also managed to snag some magazines and that orange book that Grandpa keeps in the secret compartment of his desk, when he was out of his office, to help with the jutsu as well. Because she thought every guy was exactly the same, it took her a lot longer to make her reverse sexy jutsu. The three heard something hit the ground abruptly, and when they looked, they saw Hanabi on the ground, having fallen from the tree she was hiding in. You! You are such an idiot, Hanabi exclaimed, glaring at Kanoka and showing fear at the sight of the jutsu she was using. Kanoka glared at the Hyuga and exclaimed, Why are you here? And what were you doing hiding in a tree? Hanabi, making the Hokage's granddaughter frown, said, I came here to demand a rematch to show you only got lucky beating me in the second round of our match, but after seeing those, those sorry excuses for jutsu, I don't know why I wasted my time. Hanabi scoffed at Kanoka's response, don't make fun of my jutsu, they're awesome and they're based on Aniki's jutsu. Hanabi enraged the Kanoka squad with his insult to Naruto, saying, yes, I heard. Which just proves what a fool he is, making jutsu that childish and useless, while you're an even bigger fool for doing the same. The Hyuga heiress blushed in embarrassment and rage as Kanoka uttered, I'm still the fool that managed to beat you once, and would have won the entire match too. And if the jutsu were so stupid then why did it work on you? Hanabi shot back, I was only surprised, I would never fall for a useless trick like that, again. Kanoka merely grinned in response. Kanoka gestured, then let's find out, before Hanabi continued, expressing his desire to avoid seeing that happen again. Hanabi exclaimed, go ahead, we already know I'd defeat you again anyway, so you just need to use stupid tricks like that to get an advantage, and the young Serutobi gave her the look she wanted. With Udon and Moegi appearing dubious, Kanoka exclaimed, I could beat you, easily, I've been training even harder and this time I'll be the one winning the match. Udon, not wanting to see his friend lose again, said, Kanoka, are you sure? Maybe you've been training more, but she's probably been training too. The brunette was unfazed by Moegi's addition, yeah. Besides you already proved how good you are by beating her once, you don't need to do it again. Kanoka confidently grinned and said, well, this time I'm going to do more than win one round. Hanabi was impressed. Hanabi growled at Kanoka and declared, I'll be happy to make you eat dirt again, loser. Kanoka vowed to win. After. The four children went to a training area where Moegi was positioned off to the side, Udon served as the referee, and Kanoka and Hanabi were positioned across from one another. Moegi exclaimed, Go Kanoka! Show her what you can do! Hanabi laughed at the scene. Hanabi said, Adopting her stance, having someone cheer for you, how pathetic and useless, like it'll do anything to help when this match is already decided. Kanoka shot back, adopting her own stance, saying, at least I have someone cheering for me. Udon looked between them as Kanoka and Hanabi nodded. Okay, this is a best two dot out. Of. Free match. The first with two wins is the victor. If both fighters are ready. Hajime! exclaimed Udon lowering his arm and then lunging back. Kanoka wasted no time in charging towards Hanabi, causing the Hyuga to scoff at her for doing the same move from their first match. Hanabi, however, hurried forward in an attempt to finish this quickly rather than waiting for her to approach. Kanoka yelled and threw a punch at Hanabi, but Hanabi dodged and moved closer to the Serutobi, pushing her palm forward at her abdomen. Hanabi yelled as Kanoka headbutted her, sending her reeling back, only to be startled when Kanoka blocked it. But Kanoka didn't stop there, she leapt to strike Hanabi in the head with a kick. After shoving Kanoka's kick aside with a headbutt, Hanabi rolled to the side and positioned herself to take aim at the other brunette. Kanoka grunted as she was struck in the shoulder by her thrusting palm. However, Kanoka crouched down and kicked Hanabi's legs out from under her, knocking her to the ground, as Hanabi attempted to strike her other shoulder. Hanabi didn't let this stop her, she placed her hands on the ground, spun around, and slammed her foot into Kanoka's side, causing the slightly older girl to yell. Hanabi forced Kanoka to double over, gasping for air, before she kicked herself back up to her feet and lunged at her. Hanabi slammed her palm into Kanoka's stomach. When Kanoka attempted to stand up straight, Hanabi spun around her and struck her in the back with a palm strike, 
sending her to the ground. Kanoka tried to get up despite Hanabi's hand being held back, but she froze when she saw him standing in front of her. Hanabi is the winner of the first round, Udon declared, causing the Hyuga heiress to smirk and move backward. Kanoka stood up, squinting her eyes as they resumed their original positions. Are both fighters prepared? Let's go into the second round, Hajime, Udon exclaimed as the second round got underway. Confident that she could finish this sooner than she had anticipated, Hanabi rushed towards Kanoka and was only slightly miffed when Kanoka refrained from charging her. Good to hear that she's come to terms with the inevitable, soon after, Hanabi thought as she got closer and struck Kanoka in the abdomen with her palm. When Kanoka parried her blow, Hanabi's scowl only grew deeper, but he was undeterred and delivered another palm strike. The younger brunette's eyes widened as Kanoka sidestepped the attack and leapt to land a spin kick on her head. Hanabi let out a grunt as she was knocked back, but she gasped when Kanoka lunged forward and struck her in the stomach with her knee. Though the Sarutobi staggered back as Hanabi clenched her teeth and flipped over, slamming her foot into Kanoka's chin. Feeling a little cautious now, Hanabi charged Kanoka once more and attempted to hit her, not being shocked when she reacted by crouching to avoid the blow. When the academy student threw a punch at Hanabi, Hanabi turned over the student. Hanabi landed behind Kanoka and threw her hand at her, but Kanoka kicked her leg back, causing her eyes to widen. Hanabi grunted as she skidded back a little, barely having time to raise her arms to block the kick because she was unprepared for the unexpected attack. But Kanoka turned and charged her in an instant, leaping up to give the Hyuga a kick to the chest. Hanabi grabbed Kanoka's ankle before blocking the kick this time. Kanoka, however, twisted her body in midair and slammed her other foot into Hanabi's head before she could attempt an attack, causing Hanabi to scream in response to the unexpected kick, letting go of Kanoka's leg, and enabling the Serutobi to fall to the ground in a crouch. Prior to the younger brunette being thrown into the air and falling back to the ground with a grunt, Kanoka leapt up and gave Hanabi an uppercut to the chin. Then, with a fist over Hanabi's face and a hand on her chest, Kanoka dashed forward and pinned her to the ground. Hanabi clenched her teeth at the sight, furious that Kanoka had defeated her in some way. Kanoka is the winner of the second round, Udon exclaimed, grinning at his friend as Moegi applauded. Moegi grinned broadly at Kanoka's victory over Hanabi and exclaimed, All right, way to go, Kanoka, now take her down again and win this. After Kanoka released her, Hanabi stood up and exclaimed, How? How did you do that? You didn't fight like that in the first round, the Serutobi grinned at her. This infuriated Hanabi even more when Kanoka revealed, that's because I let you win the first round. Hanabi demanded, what did you say? She was incensed and insulted that she thought she had, let, her win. Kanoka responded with a growing smirk, you heard me, I let you win, I threw the round so I could get a feel for your fighting style and once I did, I was ready to show you what I can really do. Hanabi balled her fists. I already said I've been training even harder, ever since you beat me the first time. I've also gotten Hinata. Nichan's help when she's available, allowing me to get more familiar with the Hyuga clan's fighting style and the Byakugan. But from what I've seen, you've barely improved since the last time we fought, said Kanoka, much to the annoyance of Han. Hanabi angrily retorted, she had no right telling anyone about our clan's secrets or our fighting style, they're only for the Hyuga clan to know, not an outsider, as Kanoka continued. Well it was your clan that kicked Hinata. Nichan out in the first place, if they wanted to keep their secrets, then you all should have treated her better, but now Hinata. Nichan doesn't need to keep your secrets and can tell anyone she wants, and don't blame her just because you're too lazy to train more seriously rather than believing you're better than everyone else. Kanoka retorted, making the Hyuga clench her fists in anger as she reached her limit. You don't know what I think or anything about me. I train and push myself every day to get stronger, I keep training even when I can barely stand. I would be far stronger, if my instructors spent more time training me than praising what I can already do, but all they do is say how far I've come, how strong I am, all they care about is that I'm supposed to be the future clan head and getting rewarded for their help in my training, Hanabi shouted, with Kanoka looking at her in surprise at her outburst. She could only scowl as it brought back memories of her time spent training with Ebisu, when he seemed more interested in showing her things she already knew and praising her than in imparting new knowledge. Telling her about shortcuts to becoming Hokage is all that's needed instead. I had advanced in my training when Hinata was heiress and I had more freedom to train on my own, than I ever did with instructors, 
they say I'm getting better and could start learning the advanced techniques, but all they do is teach me the same thing over and over again. Telling me things I already know to the point I know what they're going to say before they even finish!" exclaimed Hanabi, panting heavily as she attempted to control her emotions, only to have them burst open. It's her fault. All of it, all I ever wanted was to spend time with her, but she was always training. I watched her, I thought she was strong and still kind, and I wanted to be the same. I started training early because of her, and I became as strong as Hanada, strong enough that I could beat her. But she just threw the fight, making me be heiress just because she couldn't hurt me. But did she hurt me, not physically but emotionally and mentally? She betrayed my admiration, shattering the image I had of her. I knew what I was getting into with the spar, that I would get hurt, but it would be worth it to show Oni. Chan how strong I got because of her. Only for Hinata to treat me like some glass doll rather than a kunoichi, leaving me as the heiress and future clan head. Then she, she left, she left and I didn't have anyone, but now I'm going to prove I'm still better by beating you, then she'll see I don't need her or anyone else. Hanabi said before glaring at Kanoka while the slightly older brunette looked at the Hyuga, her earlier anger fading away at her rant. After hearing all of that, Moegi and Udon felt the same way making it impossible to be angry or hateful toward Hanabi for how she had treated Hinata in the past. Finding it difficult to be upset with Hanabi because she didn't genuinely feel resentment or animosity toward Hinata. Kanoka said, Udon, you can start the match, she still intended to win, but she also intended to speak with Hanabi. All right, let's start the last round, Hajime, Udon exclaimed, lowering his arm and leaping off. Hanabi lost all self control about holding back and launched herself at Kanoka right away, moving even faster. With lightning. Fast palm strikes, the Hyuga heiress forced Kanoka to leap back to avoid being hit. But Hanabi leapt into the air to pursue her, turning around and planting a foot pressure on Kanoka's head. The older brunette grunted at the force of the kick, but she was able to raise her arms in time to block it. Prior to Hanabi flipping around and landing on her feet, she grabbed her leg and threw her back, Taking another swing at the Serutobi, Kanoka also lunged forward, pulling back her fist before hurling it at Hanabi. The Hyuga then dodged under, shoving her palm squarely at Kanoka's stomach. Palm bottom! exclaimed Hanabi as she struck Kanoka, launching chakra into the area she struck and making Kanoka gag as she was hurled back into the air. Fortunately, the academy student was able to substitute herself, charging at Hanabi and sending her flying to slam her foot in. 8 trigrams palm rotation, Hanabi exclaimed, startling Kanoka as she was flung around and suddenly expelling chakra from her body to form a dome around herself. Kanoka grunted as she hit the ground and saw Hanabi leap forward while holding back her palm, causing the Serutobi to quickly roll aside as soon as Hanabi lowered her hand. When Kanoka seized the opportunity to forcefully strike her head with her foot, causing the slightly younger brunette to stumble back, all she could do was sigh. As soon as Kanoka saw her opportunity, she leapt back up, ran at Hanabi, and then struck her in the chin with her knee, knocking her head back. Then, she jumped over the Hyuga heiress by using Hanabi as a springboard to get behind her. However, Hanabi slammed her elbow into Kanoka's stomach, knocking the wind out of her, and Kanoka gagged when she tried to flip Hanabi over her shoulder by grabbing her by the back of her shirt. Hanabi gasped in agony as she turned around, struck with her palm, and sealed one of her tenketsu. Hanabi struck Kanoka once more and sealed another tenketsu, declaring, you're within my range of division, two palms. Four palms. Eight palms. Eight trigrams sixteen palms. Exclaimed Hanabi as he delivered the last palm strike, sending Kanoka hurtling backward and colliding with the earth. Moegi cried out, worried for her friend, Kanoka. Udon said, the match is. Ready to put an end to it before Kanoka suffered any more injuries. But before he could, Hanabi frowned at the sight as they were shocked to see Kanoka replaced by a log. Going through hand signals, Kanoka exclaimed, I got you, from behind Hanabi. Kanoka said, Hey, look what Satsuki. Nichan taught me too. Fire style, grand fireball jutsu. And then launched a sizable fireball towards Hanabi, shocking the Hyuga into realizing that she was proficient in the technique. On the other hand, Kanoka recalled learning the Grand Fireball Jutsu from Satsuki. Retrospective. Following Satsuki, Kanoka exclaimed, Satsuki. Nichan, come on, what Jutsu are you going to teach me? With excitement. 
The Uchiha then informed her that she would be teaching her a special kind of jutsu, but not before directing her to a specific location to start. With a small pout, the brunette followed Satsuki, saying, just be patient, we're almost there. Fortunately, they didn't have to travel far to reach a dock and pond, where Satsuki and Kanoka went to the far end of the dock. With Kanoka nodding and watching expectantly as the ravenette went through hand signs, Satsuki remarked, now what closely? Satsuki exclaimed, fire style, grand fireball jutsu, and then, to Kanoka's dismay and awe, she unleashed a tremendous fireball over the pond, which caused the water to begin steaming from the heat. The longer Satsuki kept it up, the more amazed Kanoka became, until at last she stopped the jutsu. Kanoka exclaimed, wow, you're going to teach me that? Satsuki nodded. Kanoka was amazed and moved by Satsuki's explanation, yeah, but the grand fireball jutsu is a special jutsu for my clan. It was created by the Uchiha clan and became one of our signature jutsus to the point where it was soon used as a rite of passage. When someone is able to perform it, they're considered true adults. Kanoka asked, and you're still going to teach me it, even with how important it is? Satsuki gave her a small smile and gave her a pat on the head. Satsuki said, yes, I am, because I think you're important enough to learn it and I want to teach you, but when Kanoka threw her arms around her, she stammered back. Wanting to prove she deserved to learn the jutsu, Kanoka exclaimed, thank you, nay, Chan, I promise I'll do my very best in learning it, soon I'll be able to make a fireball just as big as yours. Satsuki patted her on the back and said, I'm sure you will. Kanoka then grinned up at her. After a moment, Satsuki's eyes widened and she smiled at the brunette. Kanoka said, and if it's so important to your clan and you're teaching me it, then that makes us real sisters. Yeah, I suppose it does. Imouto, Satsuki replied as she gave the hug back. Final flashback. Kanoka had devoted all of her training time to learning the Grand Fireball because she wanted to become a master of her clan's renowned jutsu and bring honor to Satsuki. Even though it wasn't as large as the one Satsuki made, Kanoka was still happier when Satsuki grinned at her after showing her the ravenette she had made. Which only encouraged her to strive for Satsuki's level of strength, wanting to show herself that she was capable of doing the same. Rotation. Hanabi yelled as she hurriedly released Chakra from her body and started to spin preventing the fireball from striking her. Now I got you, exclaimed Kanoka, seizing the moment right before the rotation came to an end to smash her fist into the Hyuga's face. Hanabi was knocked through the air, only managing to gasp in pain before grunting as she skidded across the ground. N, 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 no, I, W. Whoa, won't, Hanabi uttered through clenched teeth as she attempted to stand again only to give up in a state of shock and dejection. Udon exclaimed, and the match is over, Kanoka is the winner, the Serutobi grinned broadly at her victory. Moegi exclaimed, Wu dot hu, way to go, Kanoka, that was amazing, as she and Udon hurried over to greet their friend. As Kanoka grinned at them, Udon exclaimed, yeah, that was really great, I did get a little worried, but you managed to win, to the brunette. Kanoka looked at Hanabi, who hadn't attempted to get back up, and said, thanks, it was really tough, but I wasn't going to give up or lose again. As Kanoka approached Hanabi and sat next to the Hyuga, she noticed that she had an empty expression in her eyes and that her smile had vanished. Kanoka said softly, hey, Hanabi, you were really awesome too, and a lot stronger than I expected. Hanabi gave her a fleeting glance before turning back to face the sky. Hanabi muttered, needing only to be left alone after being treated so poorly, you already won, so just leave me alone now. Kanoka took a seat next to Moegi and Udon and said, I mean it, you were holding back a lot in the first two rounds, but then you really had to make me try to win. I wasn't expecting the attacks and jutsu you knew. I probably would have lost if I didn't have Satsuki. Nichan's jutsu to make you use that spinning dome jutsu. Hanabi looked at her again. Udon nodded in agreement as Moegi continued, she's right, you are really strong Hanabi a lot stronger, we really thought you were going to win with how you were attacking. The Hyuga heiress looked at them next in shock as Udon said, yeah, I was going to end the match after that 8 trigrams attack you used, since I thought it was then. Both you and Kanoka really did your best and were great. Hanabi questioned why they were still praising her in spite of everything she had said and done. Why? Why are you trying to be nice to me? She exclaimed. Because. 
You're not as bad as we thought you were, Moegi said, drawing nods from Kanoka and Udon. We thought you were pretty mean when we first met and then how you were acting earlier, but you aren't so bad or mean, at least not intentionally, Udon continued. I also understand what it's like you know, having instructors that only praise you and teach you the same thing over and over again. I had one like that, he only ever talked about how he'd help me use shortcuts to become Hokage like my grandpa, and that's all I really wanted for a long time. To get a chance to have everyone stop comparing me to my grandpa and finally see me as me. Said Kanoka, as Hanabi gazed at her attentively. But then I met Aniki, along with Satsuki, Nichan and Hanada. Nichan, and I realized that if I became Hokage I'd still be compared to Grandpa. That the villagers would think I only became Hokage because it'd be expected of me to be like him. They helped me find a goal where I could really prove myself, helping train me to really grow stronger, and not with any shortcuts. Kanoka continued with a grin on his face. Kanoka continued, to the younger brunette's disapproval, and I understand why you admire and love Hinata. Nichan so much, she's really great, kind, and strong. I'm actually jealous that you got to grow up with her and know her longer. Hanabi muttered angrily, well, now you have her all to yourself. Udon said, causing Hanabi to turn back to face them, she does still care about you, even after what happened. Yeah. Hanada. Nichan still cares about you. It's why she was willing to stay away if that's what you wanted. She only wanted to do what would make you happy, so she wouldn't hurt you again," Moegi continued. Hanabi shot back, well she did. Regardless of whether Hinata was attempting to harm her or not, she did, and that's why this feeling will never go away. Then tell her that. You can say you hate her and don't want her around anymore, but from what we can see, you still care about Hinata. Nichan and want to be with her too but your refusal to tell her that is only making things worse between the two of you," Kanoka said, and Hanabi shook her head when got up. Knowing that the elders are already not pleased with her following her previous outburst, Hanabi exclaimed, because I can't, I can't care about anything but the future of the clan, I'm supposed to lead it and need to do what's best for it, and that means I can't show any weakness. Because of her training, her lessons learned, and the events that led to her being named a clan heiress, she cannot take the chance of upsetting them anymore. If they took that away from her, it would all be in vain and she would truly have nothing left. Hanabi shook her head in response to Kanoka's question, is that what you want though? To never get the chance to have Hanada, Nichan in your life again. Hanabi muttered, preferring to preserve what little she still had rather than take the chance of losing it all. You don't get it. Being heiress is all I have left that's mine, if I lose that then I'll have nothing left." The slightly younger brunette looked up to see the Kanoka squad grinning at her as Moegi said, you could have us. To Hanabi's surprise, Udon continued, yeah, we could be your friends. That way you wouldn't have to worry anymore. That's right. You can be the newest member of the Kanoka squad, though unofficial since there are only three genin on a team, but you can still hang out and play with us. You could even train with us, along with Aniki, Satsuki. Nichan and Hanada. Nichan, I'm sure Hanada. Nichan will love it if you join us, and you could try to talking to her too. Kanoka said with a beaming smile, while Hanabi. Hanabi muttered, friends. The concept alien to her as she had never really had the time to establish friends. When she became an heiress, everything else but her training became meaningless, and Hanada was the only person she had ever wanted to spend time with. She had no time for games and fun much less attempting to make friends. It didn't help that she was treated like the heiress and future clan head by all the other kids in the Hyuga clan. Even after everything she had said and done, these three, whom she had mocked and insulted, were now extending an invitation to become friends. Kanoka smiled and pulled Hanabi out of her reverie as she narrowed her eyes. Yes, friends. Maybe then you'll actually learn to relax and not be so stiff all the time. Hanabi shot back. I can unwind just fine on my own, Kanoka's smile widened. The younger brunette scowled in annoyance as Kanoka said, sure you can. Does that usually include you brooding alone when you aren't training? Or do you practice frowning in the mirror? Hanabi narrowed her eyes and said, at least I don't spend time making ridiculous jutsu. The Serutobi did not look happy. Kanoka exclaimed, my jutsu aren't ridiculous. They're useful and effective, they certainly affected you just as Hanabi got to his feet and gave her a fierce look. Kanoka grinned and got up as Hanabi exclaimed, only because I wasn't expecting it, 
I already said I'd never fall for something so childish again. Hanabi growled as Kanoka uttered, then I'll just make an even better one, maybe I'll even transform into you. Don't you dare, I won't be embarrassed by having my appearance used in your perverted fantasy, Hanabi replied. Kanoka smirked and asked, why, would you be jealous that I'd make you look good? Hanabi shot back, Kanoka now glaring at her, you'd be turning into me, if anything it'd be an improvement and only make me look better. And there's your ego again, thinking you're better than everyone else, Kanoka screamed. Hanabi sneered, you're one to talk about egos. Moegi and Udon peered between the two, amused to see that although their heads were once again in direct opposition to one another, they were no longer feeling genuine animosity or rage. They are relieved that Hanabi appears to be easing up already. At least my sexy jutsu would give you boobs since you're flatter than a board. I'll kill you, in conjunction with F. Fu and her new, team, in Takigakure, meanwhile, knelt before the council. The time has come, you four will make your way to Konoha to enter in the Chunin exams. Your performance in them is inconsequential, what matters is ensuring you reach the finals. That is when the invasion will begin, one of the elders said in reply. The ninja serving as their Jonin sensei said, we'll see that it's done, honorable council, before they all narrowed their eyes at the greenette. One of the council members asked, and you girl, do you remember your part? Yes, honorable council. Once the invasion begins I am to unleash the Nanabi within Konoha alongside the Ichibi Jinchuriki from Suna, causing as much destruction as I can. I will do my best to make sure Konoha is wiped out, F said, causing them to nod. As Fu and her, team, bowed their heads and left, a council member gave the order, see that you do. Now go, do what needs to be done to raise Takigakure higher than it has ever seen. They seemed to forget what happened the last time they tried to harm Konoha, who thought to herself as they left the village, rolling her eyes subtly. Shomei, annoyed at being reminded of how it was given away, said, the last time they made a move against Konoha, Hashirama gave them me as a consolation prize when they tried assassinating him. I doubt they think even if the invasion fails there'll be any consequences. Yes, but the Shodai isn't present at this time, and I don't think the Sandame will be as understanding after finding out that Taki sided with Orochimaru. That doesn't include Naruto when I inform him and the others, Fu mentally responded, knowing that she would locate Naruto, Satsuki, and Hinata as soon as possible to inform them of the invasion. All she wants is the opportunity to slip away from her team and inform them about the invasion when they arrive in Konoha. A strange plant, like creature that was half black and half white had been watching the Taki Ninja as they left the village, but they were unaware of it at the time. Zetsu, the Akatsuki clan's spymaster, is this creature. Zetsu sank into the earth, emerging in one of the Akatsuki's bases before passing through hand signs as he watched the Taki Ninja depart. Magic Lantern Body Jutsu Zetsu uttered before the astral projection of Akatsuki's leader Pain materialized in front of him. Pain asked, what do you have to report, Zetsu? Inquiring as to what knowledge Zetsu could provide him. Zetsu reported, knowing it's too good of an opportunity to pass up to capture three Jinchuriki at once. Leader. Sama, we just returned from spying on Takigakure with the Nanabi Jinchuriki is on her way to Konoha now. It's likely that the Ichibi Jinchuriki will be on his way as well, putting three Jinchuriki in the same village. Not to mention that they had to take a chance in order to prevent the possibility of one or more Jinchuriki dying due to Orochimaru's invasion, which would have delayed their plans until the Biju reform. Pain nodded and gestured as four more astral projections materialized. I see, Pain said. They are Sasori of the Red Sands, Didera, Kisame Hoshigaki, and Itachi Uchiha. Itachi asked, what do you need us for leader? Sama, not understanding why the four of them had been called. Pain gave the order, wanting Orochimaru dead and his ring recovered, but also wanting to make sure their plans didn't backfire and the Jinchuriki were captured. You four will be going to Konoha, where the Chunin exams are currently being hosted. As it stands, Orochimaru is planning an invasion during the Chunin exam finals with the aid of Sanagakure and Takigakure. Both villages will be sending their Jinchuriki to attack the village during the finals. Raising an eyebrow, Didera asked, you expect us to be able to just go into the village, when it'd be on high alert for the exams? She was aware that the host village was at its most secure during the Chunin exams because so many ninja and diplomats were visiting. Payne spoke. Knowing that someone like Danzo wouldn't be able to pass up the opportunity to use any advantage he could to become Hokage. 
Yes. You'll be unknowingly assisted by Danzo Shimura. Given his beliefs and goals, it's highly likely he's already aware of Orochimaru's plans or will suspect them. Sabotaging Konoha's defenses and keep his foundation from interfering once the invasion begins. Even Itachi, aware of the Warhawk's fixation with becoming Hokage, couldn't dispute that even doing so would put the village he claims to be protecting in jeopardy. Itachi questioned, what about the war against Hanzo, are you sure it's a good idea to divert half of our most powerful ninja when it's at such a crucial stage? The Akatsuki and Hanzo had been at war since the Third Shinobi World War, when Pain managed to persuade a sizable portion of Omegakure to side with him while they were the war's leaders and elite fighters. In addition, there's hope that this will convince Pain to send only two of them rather than all of them. Realizing that, in addition to Sanagakure, Takigakure, and whatever forces Orochimaru managed to muster for his hypothetical hidden village, there's a good chance Konoha will fall to an Akatsuki attack. Pain responded, certain that with the progress they've already made in his mastery of the Rinnegan, Hanzo will die by his hand regardless of whether or not the full might of the Akatsuki is brought down on him. With the progress we made so far, combined with the fact that Hanzo has clearly lost the edge he once had in the Second Shinobi World War, the Omegakure Civil War should come to a close by the time of the Chunin exams, Payne said. Well now, this is certainly sounds interesting. An invasion of two villages and a Sanin during the Chunin exams. 4S rank missing. Nin showing up and on top of all that there'll be three Jinchuriki that will probably be battling it out. Sounds like my kind of fun. Said Kisame with excitement and lust in his gaze. Sasori hoped to kill Orochimaru for his betrayal and said, we'll see that it's done, leader. Sama. Before the projections vanished, Pain gave the command, see that you do, dismissed. That's it for today, I hope you guys enjoyed this great story, see you in the next one.